It's me, Tim Dowd, the Everyday Astronaut. Good morning, and uh, sorry for jumping right into a screen and a little screen. It's just me running the show this morning. I do not have uh, Andrew, the producer that normally helps, especially with, with these on-the-road shows. Uh, we have a full separate switcher on a whole different system. So anytime I want to switch <laughs> anything around, I have to like get up, walk over there, punch it, come over here, and it's stuff that I am very unfamiliar with. So good morning. Uh, we're going to watch, hopefully watch a rocket launch today, right? And um, so here we go. Why don't we, if you know, anytime you have any questions about upcoming rocket launches, you can go, uh, you can go to this little website called everydayastronaut.com and we will take good care of you and teach you everything uh, that's going to be happening on this launch. And this launch in particular is extremely unique because they're going to be breaking some records on this one. This is a record break launch. Rec record Reckon break and launch. <laughs> Still morning here. Uh, forgive me. All right. So this is uh, w this is a rundown. The same thing we did yesterday because this uh, this got scrubbed yesterday because of weather. Today is looking uh, a little bit better at least. But this is the transporter one mission. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be taking off here as you can tell on the screen uh, in about twenty six minutes. Hopefully, <laughs> please don't scrub. Please don't scrub. I really don't want to scrub again because. Um, Ryan Chelinsky again, who, who runs the telescope with Cosmic Perspective that provided that incredible view of SN8. Uh, he's currently, he has to be at this mission in Florida. So I'm really hoping that this happens today. And then I'm really happy. And then I'm really, really, really hoping that, uh, that Starship SN9 happens on Tuesday. Cause then he'd be able to make it back here. No problem. So uh, some fingers crossed for me guys out there. <laughs> uh, the mission name, Transporter 1, this is SpaceX's first dedicated rideshare mission. Uh, so this is, we're going to be seeing a lot of these basically once a quarter. We're going to see them fill up a, you know, their entire fairing with just h literally hundreds, <laughs> hundred plus uh, satellites. So today, uh, so the launch provider for this, of course, is SpaceX. This is a SpaceX launch, uh, but the customer are all of these. All of these people are and more <laughs> like you have to have and more at the end because there's just a ton. But uh, one interesting note is that there are 10 Starlink satellites in this payload. And that's um, that's pretty cool. There's still 10 Starlink satellites. So they're still launching some of their own satellites even and all of these other people. Um, so, yeah, we will we will see. Um, it's pretty nuts. So the rocket for this is a Falcon 9 Block 5. This is B1058-5. So, of course, the dash 5 means this is this particular booster's fifth flight. Um, it flew last time 48 days ago. Actually, I think I need to refresh this because I think it's 49 days ago. 
Um, I'm so sorry, Trevor. There we go. Forgot to refresh. Um, 49 days ago. So uh, again, that's that would be kind of below last year's average by quite a bit. And I expect that turnaround time to decrease throughout the year even more and more and more. Um, absolutely. So this, the launch location for this is Space Launch Complex 40 or Slick 40, uh, which is at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Of course, you can tell it's at Cape Canaveral Space Force Force Station because of SLC. So Space Launch Complex means it's at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. If it just says LC, that means Launch Complex, and that's at the Kennedy Space Center side. Same little strip of land, basically, but fun little distinction. The payload mass for this is about 5,000 kilograms, or around 11,000 pounds. These satellites, now here's something fun. They're going into a 500-kilometer sun-synchronous orbit, or SSO. That's, that's one of those orbits that, um, due to orbital precession and all these other fun things, it's actually like basically polar, but it's slightly tilted so that somehow as the sun's gravity pulls on it, it basically is always going to be uh, flying over the earth uh, where the sun is at the exact same place all the time. So as the earth spins underneath it, you'll be able to get satellite images of the um, you'll be able to get satellite images of the same place with the shadows in the same place because the sun's always like in the exact same position in the sky relative to the satellite for these. So it's really good for, for uh, Earth imaging stuff. But this is interesting because that has never been done for Starlink. Starlink's always been in this, like, 57-degree inclination, I believe, um, or somewhere around there. And uh, these are way closer to 90. I think they're actually, if I remember, they're slightly retrograde, like 92 degree or something. Um, now, the interesting thing to remember is this is basically a polar orbit uh, flying north and south, but it is launching from Florida. So this is the second time we're seeing this uh, very recently. So... Uh, yeah, that you know that we saw that uh, if for the ArabSat mission just a little bit ago. Uh, what was that about three or four months ago? And it flies down the coast of Florida, dog legs, and and basically weaves a nice little path around some islands. Uh, so you're not overflying land because of course that's why you would normally that's why you launch from Florida in the first place is it's nice and far south, and then you fly east and you're overflying water in non-populated areas. You still don't want your rocket, no matter how reliable it is, to be flying over cities and stuff because if it goes boom, uh, you, you you're raining engines and debris down on people's houses. Not good. Uh, now normally when you're doing a polar launch from California. They're flying with, so California kind of has that angle and then it goes straight north. Um, so if you're going from like, like where Santa Barbara is, uh, all the way to the coast, it's kind of at that, that angle. And, uh, if you launch south from there, you're not, you're able to not overfly any land. So that's what they normally would do. But lately they've gotten into this kick where they just fly it and dog it because the Falcon 9 has enough performance to do so. Pretty amazing. Uh, okay, so will they be attempting to recover the first stage? Yes, it'll be 553 kilometers downrange on, of course, I Still Love You. That's the name of the drone ship. And there's a tug called Flynn Fogget and a support vessel called Go Searcher. Will they be attempting to recover the fairings? The fairing recovery is expected. Um, Go Mystery and Go Mischief are stationed about 600 kilometers downrange. Uh, so about 1,000 miles downrange. Uh, or sorry, <laughs> about, uh, I did it backwards. About, oh, great. I broke myself. About 400 kilometers. Well, it's a little more than that. I don't know. 400 ish miles downrange. Are these fairings new? Yes, uh, they are new. Uh, how's the weather looking? The weather is currently 70% go. Thank goodness. Like I said, I need this thing to launch <laughs> really bad. And um, yeah, so so we'll see. So this is uh, all the fun stuff. This is the most satellites ever launched at 143. Uh, that's a record breaking mission. Uh, ISRO, a couple years, four, th three or four years ago, launched 103 or four, and that was uh, pretty amazing. This is taking that up quite a bit to 143. Uh, it will officially be the most ever launched. It's about, uh, I read a thing, and I, I probably should have fact checked this, so I'm not just spreading it, but it's, it's around. RP1 load closeout. Oh, good, RP1 load closeout. Um, it is about 5% of um, all active satellites currently will be on this single launch. That's insane. So this will be the first Starlinks to ever go to a polar orbit, which does mean that there there should be some beginning to be some a little bit of coverage over the poles even. So say you're, um, you know, at Antarctica, the Antarctic South Stations and stuff like that, uh, you could actually get some internet soon with Starlink, which is really good because they have abysmal internet. Uh, this is the first uh, mission ever to with Go Searcher and uh, or as the ASDS support, so as the autonomous spaceport drone ship. This is the first time that Go Searcher has been the support for that. The second fastest turnaround of a booster 
at 49 days. The first Falcon 9 launch with a transfer stage, which is really strange. I hope they talk about that more in the in the in the mission because it's a strange transfer stage. This is the first SpaceX dedicated rideshare mission ever. The 106th Falcon 9 launch, the 52nd reflight of a booster, the third reflight of a booster in 2021 already. So all missions in 2021. Um, the 73rd booster landing, the 42nd landing attempt, and of course, I still love you. The first autonomous spaceport drone ship landing in a polar corridor on the East Coast, of course. Uh, on the West, co- West Coast, there's um, they la- have landed on, um, op- on what some of the drone ships before, but on the East Coast, they have not. The only other one they did, did a return to launch site landing. Uh, 23rd consecutive landing, which is a new record for SpaceX. Uh, third launch for SpaceX in 2021, as we mentioned, basically, and 63rd SpaceX launch from Slick 40. So if you guys have any more questions about this and and some of the images in here, uh, definitely check out this article. It'll give you a rundown on a lot of the different payloads because there are a lot of – this is that that transfer stage, the Sherpa. Um, There's a lot of things to to run down here and read. So if you have any questions about this mission or, again, basically any other upcoming missions – uh, go to everydayastronaut.com and watch the uh, pre-launch preview. So, um, okay, here's what I have to do. I either have to go over there and punch myself up big. <laughs> I probably should just do that so you're not just seeing a tiny. Well, I mean, whatever. What do you guys? What do you guys think? I probably should go. Uh, I, I'm going. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Everyone say thank you to Trevor for for an awesome article. He worked really hard on that one because it has a ton of extra things in it. But here, I'm gonna I'm gonna go over. I'm gonna switch the shot. Real quick. This might take me a second. Cause I'm not good at it. I did it. I did it. <laughs> Andrew would be so proud. <laughs> it took me longer than I admit. I would like to admit. Okay, so this is from uh, <laughs> the mighty Sir Wolf of Clan of Wolfmore. By the way, the reason it's so hard, it's not like OBS. OBS is like, boop. Here it's like, oh, you have to untie the other scene. You have to tie the camera to be the big thing. And then, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's weird. I'm not used to like broadcast software stuff. It is very strange. Uh, the mighty Sir Woof, Woof of Clan Woofmore says, What are the similarities and differences between the third stage used for this mission and the kick stage of Electron? Hashtag Team Space, hashtag Go SN9. So, uh, a big difference, basically. And I'm really confused how this is even a stage. I'm pretty sure it's basically just a separate dispenser that will be detached um, and then it detaches the payloads later because it doesn't have any onboard propulsion like at all. If I, if I recall, I don't think it has any, uh, yeah, any onboard propulsion, which is really confusing. It might have some gyroscopes or something to stabilize itself. Uh, but I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't have the, the, uh, the Sherpa. I, I just don't, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> so the similarities are, uh, it dispenses satellites the differences are it doesn't have any onboard propulsion. It will eventually have onboard propulsion. So, yeah. Um, so we'll see if uh, we'll see when that happens. All right. Hey, let me make sure that I do have the other stream pulled up and ready to go. So that we. Oh, good. They do have the stuff ready. Give me one second here.
LWO on WeatherNet. Uh, lift off conditions looking pretty good. ATS is ready for launch. Ignition. Lift off. Falcon 9 has cleared the tower. Ten, nine, eight. Side booster ignition. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Good morning. It's Sunday, January 24th, and we're here at SpaceX's headquarters in Hawthorne, California. You're looking at a live view of Falcon 9 as it awaits its 10 a.m. Eastern Time launch from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. My name is Andy Tran, and I'm a production supervisor here at SpaceX. Welcome to the webcast for SpaceX's Transporter 1 mission. It's our first dedicated SmallSat rideshare program launch and third launch of 2021. If you just joined us, if you joined us yesterday, you know we scrubbed for weather specifically for the surface electricity field rule. Today's weather has also been a bit challenging, but we're currently looking good for our T0 liftoff time. On board this mission are 133 commercial and government spacecraft, in addition to 10 Starlink satellites, the most spacecraft ever deployed on a single mission. This count includes CubeSats, MicroSats, and two orbital transfer vehicles, sometimes called space tugs, which will deploy their spacecraft after separating from Falcon 9. SpaceX created the SmallSat rideshare program to provide small satellite operators with competitive pricing, increased flight opportunities, flexibility, and most importantly, a ride to space on SpaceX's Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, as well as Starship in the not-too-distant future. For more details on our rideshare program or to reserve your spot, head over to our website at spacex.com slash rideshare. Now let's take a look at Falcon 9 out on the pad at the Cape. You're looking at a live view of Falcon 9, our 70-meter two-stage liquid field launch vehicle. Today's mission is the fifth flight for this particular booster. Its first four flights were all in 2020, which included our Crew Dragon Demo 2 mission for NASA in May, the ANASYS-2 mission in July, a Starlink mission in October, and most recently, CRS-21 in December. You can tell by the re-entry soot at the bottom of the vehicle that this booster has flown before. That bottom two-thirds of the vehicle is the first stage. Its objective is to accelerate the vehicle through the Earth's atmosphere into space and then separate from the rest of the rocket. From there, it will make its way back to Earth and target a landing on a recovery vessel. Of course, I still love you. There she is on screen. On top of the first stage is the black carbon fiber inner stage. This composite material houses the larger nozzle of the second stage engine. And then on top of the inner stage is the Falcon 9 second stage, which will take the payload to its eventual destination in orbit. After the first stage separates about, one and, uh, about two and a half minutes into flight, the second stage will then carry the 143 spacecraft to orbit. In order to get to the intended orbit today, we'll need to light our second stage twice before deploying all of our payloads. And at the top of the rocket, you'll notice a large nose cone. This is called the fairing. It's a composite structure and protects the rocket from the forces of ascent and also houses our payloads. Once the vehicle is outside of the Earth's atmosphere, the fairing separates to expose the satellites to space. For today's mission, both fairings halves are brand new. And our recovery vessel, Miss Chief, will be attempting to recover the fairing halves from the water following landing. And finally, the large truss structure next to Falcon 9 is called the transporter erector. We also refer to it as the TE. Its job is to roll Falcon 9 out to the launch pad, raise it to a vertical launch position, and also route power, fluids, and communication to the rocket and satellite. It will retract away from the rocket slightly around the T minus a T minus four and a half minute mark, providing clearance for Falcon 9 to lift off. The chief engineer held a technical pull at the T minus one hour mark, and the launch director held a propellant load and launch go no goal, go no goal pull at the T minus 38 minute mark. Uh, weather is still tracking uh, to be green for a T zero liftoff. Falcon 9 has been loading propellants since the T minus 35 minute mark. The vehicle uses a refined form of kerosene called RP1 for its fuel and super chilled liquid oxygen or LOX as its oxidizer. Currently, RP1 is fully loaded on the second stage and nearly fully loaded on the first stage. Uh, liquid oxygen is currently loading 
and uh, currently underway on both stages. As for Helium, it began loading before the webcast went live and will continue to top off until about a minute and a half before launch. We use Helium as a pressurant uh, as the propellants are pulled out by the engine pumps. In about a minute, around T minus seven minutes, uh, engine chilling will begin. This is where we allow a small amount of super chilled liquid oxygen to flow into the Merlin engine turbo pumps prior to the full flow of locks to avoid any thermal shocks to the system. Checkouts of the second stage thrust vector control actuators will also be underway. This is known as the engine wiggle test. We move the thrust chamber slightly to make sure that the guidance hardware is a go for flight. Uh, the first stage actually does the same test, but it happens just seconds before ignition. So far, the vehicle is healthy. We are currently working no issues. The range is standing by and currently green for launch. And again, weather is a tracking item, but right now we are green for a T0 liftoff time. We are currently seven minutes from liftoff. Falcon 9 is now moving into the final stages of the countdown. Uh, in about two minutes, the transport rector will start to retract away and enter its pre-launch position about two degrees from the rocket. Uh, at liftoff, hydraulics will move it to a position about 45 degrees away from the rocket. Uh, again, around the T-minus four and a half minute mark, you, you will hear some hiss and pop, and that's pressure venting from the rocket and the plumbing of the transporter erector. The vehicle remains in good health. Uh, we're continuing to load propellant on both the first and second stages. You can see that we've had some gaseous oxygen venting from Falcon 9. About a minute before liftoff, you'll hear the announcement that Falcon 9 is in startup, which means that the rocket's own internal Check flight one, computers two. are now autonomously controlling the launch countdown. The payload inside the fairing Stage house continue to be healthy. Uh, Falcon 9 team is tracking no issues on the rocket. Uh, weather, again, is a tracking item for us, but currently we're green. And as a reminder, if we don't launch today, um, we'll make another attempt sometime in the future, and we'll let you know as soon as we know that date. Okay. I'm back, guys. Figured it out. Just took <laughs> way too much time. All right, so let's do our uh, pointy end up, flimmy and down check. Fantastic shot for that, as, as you can I tell As I mentioned now. earlier, today's launch is the first of SpaceX's dedicated small sat rideshare program, which provides small satellite operators with competitive pricing and increased flight opportunities on board the world's most advanced and proven launch vehicles. This part of, as part of the program, we also offer traditional rideshare opportunities on existing low Earth orbit missions and on SpaceX's Starlink missions, which launch about once a month. Traditionally, it's pretty hard to find affordable space on a rocket for a small satellite. Our rideshare program groups small sets together, making it easier to purchase a less expensive ticket to orbit on a predictable schedule. And unlike traditional rideshare opportunities, our rideshare missions are not dependent on a primary payload. Our missions are pre-scheduled and will not be held by delays with co-passengers. So that means that if you're ready to fly during the scheduled launch period, you will fly. Since we announced the program, we have launched four rideshare missions, including two Starlink missions with Planet on board, one Starlink mission with space, with space flight riding along, as well as the Southcom 1B mission. And in fact, one of these customers flew less than six months after their contract with SpaceX, which is a pretty remarkable turnaround time. We're really excited for today's mission, not only because it's the first dedicated rideshare, but because it will also be the most spacecraft ever deployed on a single mission. As I mentioned earlier, in addition to the more than 130 small satellites on board for our commercial and government customers, we have 10 Starlink satellites of our own riding along. And as many of you may know, Starlink is a constellation of satellites that can provide high speed, low latency internet all over the globe, particularly in remote or rural areas where connectivity is limited or completely unavailable. The 10 Starlink satellites launching aboard this mission will also be the first Starlink satellites deployed to a polar orbit, and many of the future Starlink sats flying to the pole orbit will actually launch from our Vandenberg site here in California. 
The Van Ingburn team is, ha is hiring for a number of open positions to support our growing operations there. If you are interested in working on the launch team that will help all kinds of payloads launch from our West Coast facility, head over to SpaceX.com slash careers and apply. So yeah, sorry again for the technical difficulties. If this was OBS, I could just be like, boop, boop. But um, yeah, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. What do you mean no sound? We are about three <laughs> minutes from liftoff. Falcon 9 is moving into the final stages of the countdown. The payload and vehicle remain healthy, and we're still currently tracking weather to be green for a T-0 liftoff at 10 a.m. Eastern. So again, uh, that is not smoke you're seeing. That is condensation. That rocket is extremely cold right now. If you went up and touched it, yeah, I, let's just say you wouldn't want Stage to touch one it. Stage one out complete. Sweet. In about 30 seconds around the T-minus two-minute mark, we should finish liquid oxygen loading, and that will wrap up the, the final propellant loading for Falcon 9. Yeah, you definitely don't lick it. You 100% do not lick that rocket while it's on the pad. Your tongue would definitely stick to it. Uh, yeah, cold, <laughs> freezing cold aluminum would not be smart. But, uh, yeah, again, we do have confirmation of good pointy end up, flaming and down. I'm really hoping this baby takes off today, guys. Oh, I do need to fix the clock a little bit, though. Sorry, guys. All the little things that that normally just Andrew does. <laughs> For those just joining us, this is the Transporter 1 mission for SpaceX, the third launch of 2021, and the first dedicated small set rideshare mission for SpaceX. And we just heard the call that lock, lock loading is completed. Again, that is the last of propellant loading for Falcon 9. And on screen, you can start to see some white clouds forming around Falcon 9. That is normal and expected for us at this stage in the countdown. That is uh, liquid oxygen condensing as it meets the warmer ambient temperatures of the Florida air. So again, sorry Falcon guys. Falcon 9's in startup. Yes, please, please, please. And the vehicle is in startup. Both stages are beginning to pressurize for launch. In a few seconds here, we should be hearing LDM the launch truck to give the final go, go for, for liftoff. LD on countdown one, go for launch. And yes. there you heard it. That is the final go for launch at T minus 35 seconds. All systems T are go for the seconds. Transporter 1 mission. Let's listen and watch in as we lift off from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. Hey guys, this is fantastic news. I'll be getting to all your questions. There'll probably be a plenty of a coast phase here in today's mission, so plenty of time to talk about some of the stuff going on and to answer your questions. But for now, guys, I just gotta be excited. You'll see me pop it on the screen seconds. trying to run some of this stuff, but let's see this. Let's see 143. Also, this 10, goes out nine, to those families, eight, those loved ones on seven, board this rocket today. Six, we'll talk about five, this in a second. Here we go. Four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. And lift off. Impulse pitching downrange. Stage one chamber pressure is nominal. plus 43 seconds into flight. Falcon 9 has cleared the tower and is currently throttling down to prepare for max Q at around the T plus one minute and 12 second mark. Max Q is where the vehicle will experience the highest amount of aerodynamic pressures. Falcon, Falcon 9 is supersonic. Notice a little bit of flames propagating Max up Q. the sides a little bit because and we've just passed Max Q. That is a really cool tracking shot of Falcon 9. All is looking good with the Stage 1 trajectory. 
in about a minute, we have three events coming up in quick succession. First up is main engine cutoff. That's where the nine engines on the first stage will shut off, followed by stage separation, where the first and second stages will separate from one another. Uh, shortly after that, we'll have a second engine start one. The Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage will ignite its engine and continue its journey into orbit. So yes, you might notice some flames actually. And back engine chill has begun. Crawling up the sides a little bit from a low pressure zone from a, a, the wake of the rocket, and especially the landing legs will produce this little wake, and the higher uh, pressure flames and, and the pressure of the, the flame front can actually creep up into those lower pressure zones, and I think that's really cool. Of course, it's it's normal, and uh, and accounted for. So We're about no 20 deal. seconds away from main engine cutoff, the start of those three events happening in rapid succession. Am I still quiet, guys, or do you guys hear me okay? So I have to step away for one second. Main engine cutoff. Stage separation confirmed. Coming up in a few seconds, we should have the fairing deploy. In back ignition. Bearing separation confirmed. And there you can see the two fairing halves have separated and fallen away from the vehicle, exposing the 143 spacecraft to the vacuum of space. And as a reminder, our recovery vessel, Miss Chief, will be attempting to recover the fairing halves today from the water. So again, we do have simulated telemetry for the first stage. It looks like it's a tiny bit off, but it's normally pretty darn close. Uh, you can see that the first stage is still coasting up. It was actually coasting up once the engine cuts off. It still coasts up, and eventually will start falling down. We're at T plus three minutes and 30 seconds into flight. We have a couple of views on screen right now. Uh, on the right-hand uh, right side is a view of the second stage, specifically the uh, MVAC engine. It's currently in the first of its two MVAC burns. This burn should last for about another five minutes or so. And on the left-hand side of your screen is a view from the top of our first stage looking down. The next milestone for the first stage will be its, its re-entry burn. Uh, Falcon 9 needs to execute an entry burn to slow itself down before hitting the dense parts of the atmosphere. Uh, without this burn, relying on the atmosphere alone to slow Falcon 9 down will put unnecessary strain on the rocket. And a insane amount of temperature the the heat the that entry burn is coming up at around the t plus seven minute and 47 minute mark just a few minutes from now okay so get ready the rocket's still translating sideways but it will start falling any second you can see the altitude slowing down on that first stage looks like our feed just went to not 1080 what for those just joining us this is the the okay. Transporter 1 mission for SpaceX, uh, the first dedicated small sat rideshare program mission, and it's also the third mission of 2021. We're just waiting on the next major event for this mission, which is the first stage entry burn that's going to be happening around the T plus 7 minute and 47 mark. That is an awesome view for stage one. Look at that. And you can see it's going to start falling here any second. You can see some periodic bursts of gas from the first stage. That is nitrogen from our attitude, attitude control systems. They help to orient the first stage as it continues to make its descent back towards Earth. A real quick... We do just want to welcome Jack to space. Think about that, guys. That's... That is profound. That is beautiful. And as, as we get closer wow. to uh, the Earth, you'll start to notice those honeycomb-like structures on the left-hand side of your screen start to move and pivot. Those are, are, are our hypersonic grid fins, and those help to steer the first stage back um, as it uh, returns back to Earth. For those of you that, that don't know, there is uh, there are... Uh, ashes of loved ones on this vehicle. As for the second stage, back performance looks nominal. 
And, uh, and Just a few seconds after we finish the stage one entry burn, we'll be shutting off the second stage Merlin vacuum engine and enter a small coast phase. Again, we'll need to relight this engine later on in the mission to get to our eventual destination in orbit. And yeah, we just want to give a quick shout out and some love to Sean and Mandy, who again, we just saw uh, Jack is there, uh, a, a baby that they uh, that unfortunately passed early, obviously. Uh, but uh, some of Jack's ashes Stage are on this rocket, effect. which is just beautiful. So We are about 45 seconds away from that Stage 1 entry burn. Uh, for the entry burn, it is a three-engine burn, so three of the nine Merlin engines on the first stage will relight and start to slow the stage down before it hits the denser parts of the Earth's atmosphere. So yeah, you might you might have noticed a little a little bit of ice coming off of the left side of the booster. That's that's normal. That happens all the time. Actually, uh, it, it's actually a little bit of ice that seems to collect right around the grid fins, and it pops off its little ring and it floats. We will see that comment over and over. What was that thing that that fell off? Is that okay? Just ice. <laughs> it's totally normal. Totally normal. So notice the first stage is still speeding up, but as soon as one entry burn start up, here we go. Get ready. It's going to start slowing down like crazy now. About three or four Gs. And there's the entry burn. Three of the nine Merlin engines have relit. This burn is expected to last for about 30 seconds. Pulling four Gs now of deceleration. Second stage in terminal guidance. Stage one entry burn shut down. And you can see on screen the entry burn has concluded. And in just a few seconds, we should be here on the call up for a second engine cutoff, where we'll shut down the second stage MVAC engine. Now go ahead and watch the first stage booster. Uh, watch the speed here. It'll actually start slowing down already now at 30 kilometers. Okay, that's, 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 you know, pretty high up there, but it's, all, it's experiencing more and more atmosphere. Second stage. And look at the G-force meter. It is, it is getting cranked. It's, it's Plus the signal stage one. four, you know, four Gs. Uh, it's really, really, really decelerating extremely fast. Look at that trajectory. It Second does overfly some islands and stuff, but it's such a weird trajectory. <laughs> I just don't get it. But, uh, yeah, you'll definitely notice uh, it, now, it's slowing down a lot. As I mentioned earlier, we are going to be attempting to recover the booster for a fifth time. No, no parking orbit on our, on our drone ship, of course, I still love you. The first stage has one more burn left, the landing burn, and it, it begins just before we touch down and provides the booster with a soft descent before we land. That should be starting up any time now. And we did get confirmation of the second stage that it did reach a good parking orbit. It should be there. Stage anyway. one landing leg deploy. LOS stage two, Cape Canaveral expected. Yeah, baby. They nailed it. And Falcon 9 returns safely once again. That is the fifth time for this particular booster and the 73rd recovery of an orbital class rocket. A uh, great way to start off the mission and a great way to start off the Sunday. We're now going to coast for the next 45 minutes or so while we wait for SCS-2 or second engine start number two. We're gonna leave you with an animation that shows you where we're at in the coast phase. And we'll see you back here at the T plus 54 minute mark. Okay, so uh, isn't it crazy that it actually is overflying the land? Let me turn this down real quick. Uh, it's kind of nuts that they, that they overfly Cuba and stuff like that. I, I honestly can't believe how easy they make it. So uh, already, congrats SpaceX for, for landing. And notice that the feed didn't cut out. People always complain the feed cuts out. It's really hard. Trust me, I'm now learning how hard it is to sling data from point A to point B, especially when you're on a rocking drone ship. Uh, that has to sling data through plasma field, the exhaust of a rocket. Um, oh, there we go. Now is SpaceX is better. I see what's going on. I seem to learn this stuff better. 
All right, hopefully that's better. So, uh, so yeah, so do notice that, you know, it's really hard to keep the signal on the drone ship. And people ask all the time, why don't they make a, a buoy or fly a drone around or something? The simple answer is really, what's it worth? Why, why would you spend even even ten thousand dollars twenty thousand dollars to make it so we see that one extra second normally maybe there's a four or five second cutout sometimes but why even have what that's spacex doesn't care about that spacex doesn't care about making sure that we have perfect footage of the landing because that's completely ancillary and and really not necessary compared to anything that they're actually doing which is flying and delivering payloads period so um yeah so so mad uh mad weasel we we talked about that really quick uh at, at six minutes and 11 seconds, we did see something fall off. That's ice that happens almost every time they open up the grid fins. There's actually, I, I don't think it actually is the, the grid fins port. I think it's the oxygen relief port. There's actually the place where the oxygen dumps. Uh, and it's in this, normally it's either half of a ring or a full ring. I think it's just ice buildup from exactly that. Or it's something uh, ice buildup in and or around the, uh, the grid fins. So... Um, it happens almost every time. So, yeah, um, it was really cool, though, to see it not uh, blow up this time on landing. So, all right, let's get through some of these comments here because I am way behind. And we do have a decent amount of time here before we see anything else. So, Argonaut says, hi, fingers crossed for today's launch. I am so happy, honestly, that it launched. Hopefully, we can get Ryan out here before SN9. So, now I'm just hoping that it doesn't launch, that SN9 doesn't launch tomorrow. Um, let's see. Yeah, we, we absolutely need to do that. Um, Stanley, hi Tim. Uh, say hello to everyone for me. Go 143. Stanley, you don't have to say. You don't have to. Hi Stanley, you don't have to do that. But yes, go 143 satellites. That is awesome. I will absolutely do that. Um, Brian Clausen, morning. Uh, morning Tim. I think we all need coffee today. Snowing in Wisconsin. I am. Uh, I'm glad for now to be uh, down south because I'm avoiding all of the snow. It's been pretty fantastic. So, uh, yeah. Thank you, Brian. Good to hear from you. From uh, Pietro says, hi, Tim. Do you think uh, there will be a future, uh, a single engine as powerful as the F1 or RD-170 for super heavy lift rockets, or a lot of engines are the future? I think we're proving SpaceX, it, the thing with, with smaller engines um, is you have the you know economies of scale, so you can actually scale up the production of the engines. You can also get some reliability increase because there's a little bit of a bathtub curve. Of course, if you have a ton of engines, you do have the more you have potential for them to break, right? But if you have more engines, you can have an engine go out as opposed to one big, uh, you know, like say the RD-170, which is a four-chambered engine, but it's really only one engine. If that thing goes out at any point during ascent, you're gone. Your your mission is completely gone. And so, you know, if you have multiple engines, the other thing is by flying multiple engines, say you say you have the option of flying uh, five engines or nine engines, right? Uh, nine engines, you'll get a lot more data out of how reliable those engines are. And again, a kind of kind of like economies of scale, uh, you can you can learn the you know, the inner workings and the, the limits of the engines a lot quicker, like almost twice as fast because you're flying them twice as much. You get twice as much data and you can make an even more and more reliable engine because of that. So. Yeah, um, I, I think personally, I think there's there's always a trade off there, uh, and it's easier to manage. Like think about how easy it is for SpaceX to in install and uninstall a Raptor engine. They do those things. Um, Elon wants to get that down to a couple hours. Of course he does, um, but currently, you know, it takes about a day for them to swap out a Raptor engine. No big deal. Um, now imagine if you have a huge, you know, F1 engine, you had to swap it out. That could be a while. You know, just the machinery even to pick up and move an F1 around is just substantially bigger and and more cumbersome right as opposed to something smaller uh, easier to handle so there's there's all these trade-offs but i do think smaller and more engines is kind of the current uh is kind of the way that a lot of things are, are happening now um from stone love the channel just wondering what software to use for the countdown overlay so that's actually custom software that that andrew wrote um so he actually just wrote uh html that that we pop into there so we have an overlay that's just a png and then we have uh, just a countdown clock that that we type in the time, and it, it happens for launches that don't have it. When we do those launches that are ish, we actually hit go uh, on a just on a website right when it hits, uh, right when we see ignition or launch. So that's how we can do it for SN9. Is as soon as we see ignition, we hit go. That'll start a T plus clock for us. So it's really really cool. Um, Andrew did an awesome job, and he whipped it up in no problem. <laughs> Okay, whatever. HTML isn't programming scripting language. Okay, he, 
Um, and then also the things that you see here, uh, like this stuff pop up, is Colton, who, uh, it's not David Willis, but Colton is the one that wrote this Tomorrow chat system, which is awesome too. So uh, so they kind of are both integrated, which is awesome. But anyway, David Willis, uh, so thank you to Colton. Uh, David Willis says, when's the next Falcon Heavy launch? It's been quite a while. Yeah, we're supposed to see a Falcon Heavy launch here uh, in the next couple uh in the next couple months i think like two or three months we're supposed to see one um in march ish is kind of the last we're hearing of. i think it was march but you never know it could be it could be march it could be april uh, i can't wait to see falcon heavy unfortunately i think the next falcon heavy is going to be dual drone ship landings so they won't even be both uh, rtls so they're both uh returning to launch site they the normal you know like we've seen so far the three falcon heavies that have launched so far all return back to launch site uh this one in order to increase the performance of falcon heavy two of the the two side cores are going to be landing um they're going to be landing down down range aren't they um and then <laughs> uh and then the center core i believe is the center core for that one getting getting trashed i forget which is sad because they still have never yeah uh the the core stage has never successfully been <laughs> reused or even brought back into port they've landed it once it did not survive the trip back home which is really sad um all right tobias says thanks tim i enjoy watching your videos and live streams a lot i'm going to start my bachelor in aerospace engineering soon uh, greetings from the netherlands that's awesome uh kick some butt out there i hope you learn a lot and i hope that you do some really really cool things uh for all of us you know that's that's absolutely for all of us all right, so this is from Eric S. Uh, thanks for the streams, Tim. Uh, will you be at any of the upcoming Vandenberg Air Force Base California launches this year? Looking forward to the Dart Falcon 9 launch on July 22nd. Um, maybe, Eric. One of the things that I do want to see, I want to see the Firefly Alpha launch from there. I think that'd be really cool. Uh, that's going to be, that's a, actually a really surprisingly large vehicle. It's kind of like Falcon, it's actually, it's almost like Falcon 5, really. Um, it's it's pretty big. It's like thirty meters tall. Uh, so it's a lot bigger than Electron, uh, and it's also it is uh, carbon fiber as well, kind of like Electron. It'd be a cool sat uh, small sat launcher to see fly for sure. So um, I've thought about going out to that one. That one's soonish. I don't know. Um, we will see. Uh, but I don't know. I still at this point I've already chewed up most of my days that I want to be away from home, just down here trying to catch S and nine. <laughs> so we'll see. This is from Tori Bruno's Cowboy Hard Hat. Listen to OLF on the way home. SpaceX could use the LNG liquid, uh, liquefied natural gas tanker to deliver methane and O2 to Phobos and Deimos. Yes, absolutely. They could use a, a tanker to, to deliver methane. Um, absolutely. Yep. That's. I think that's the, the best way. So, by the way, what, uh, what Tori Bruno's Cowboy Hard Hat is talking about, OLF is the podcast that I do each week called Our Ludicrous Future. Uh, you can find it either on YouTube here or on any of your favorite podcast players by going to olfpod.com. So you don't have to try to spell ludicrous. Trust me, it's hard. Um, but yeah, the uh, but that's definitely. I mean, I, I think there will be a large propellant farm on the um, you know on the the sea launch platforms for sure, and I, they'll have to be fueled up and everything by large tankers. So um, yeah, I, I think that's the only way to really do that for sure. So. Uh, Chamey Chain wants to know uh, what streaming software to use. So here, because what we're doing here, we have tons of cameras normally for SN9. Uh, we are using an ATEM switcher, um, a Blackmagic ATEM switcher and, and their software. Plus we're using uh, Casper CG to do the overlays and stuff like that. And then uh, we also have to run uh, uh, separate audio suites so that we can do all of the things. It's it's a lot more cumbersome than, than OBS, but it's also because it's all um, hardware, it's a lot more redundant. So we could lose a lot of a lot of things in our chain and still be up. And OBS, if you start plugging in a ton of cameras and have a, a ton of different capture cards for all those different cameras, first off, it's just it's it's really just not the right way to do things. Um, so yeah, so this this is definitely more robust, but it really does take a team. I definitely should have had Cooper come out and help. Uh, I forgot to hit him up and be like, "Hey, you want to try switching the show?" Uh, that would have been great. But um, yeah, uh, I, I will have help at least from from Cooper and or Caitlin, who are going to be uh, hopefully able to switch the show for SN nine. So hopefully I, I don't have to do try to wear too many hats. That would be fantastic. So yeah, so ATEM stuff. We're actually going to be switching to. 
um, a bigger control surface for ATEM, and a I think we're going to go with the ATEM 4K 2ME switcher too. If anyone out there is a broadcast nerd, uh, it'll be I think it'll be a really good switcher choice, and that will allow us to do a few more things and have even more inputs. Because uh, right now we're limited; we only have four SDI inputs and four H, uh, HDMI inputs, which is not ideal. So we're kind of pushing this to the limits. We can expand that, <laughs> kind of a jank way to expand, but kind of a fun way. We can plug in like an ATEM Mini uh, to that to basically pre-switch. So it's almost like having uh, a secondary auxiliary set of switching. So if we do feel like we need more feeds now, we can expand our, our switchboard doing it that way. It's definitely not the right way to do things. Uh, once, you know, if I get a Studio B figured out, uh, that is something I would love to do would be able to, you know, really deck it out with, with proper, I'm, I'm learning the, the pros of a proper hardware switcher. It'd be quite amazing. So, all right. Um, this is from David Swenson. Uh, thanks for all you're doing coffee for the crew. Well, thank you very much, David. The crew currently is me, which is horrifying. <laughs> uh, I, like I said, I, I've lost Andrew to work. He works for ESPN. He shoots for ESPN. So he's doing a bunch of shows uh, this weekend. He can't get back here until uh, quite a bit later. Uh, and then Ryan is was shooting Transporter 1. And uh, But like I said, I, I do have some other ha helping hands, of course, as Padre helps quite a bit. Uh, not quite a bit. They help a ton. <laughs> um, you can kind of see in the background the mess here. We have been setting up and testing camera stuff again. Almost every time I... We, we just keep trying to like clean it up and label it and make it more efficient and make it more redundant and more uh, robust. So we have a lot of interesting solutions on how our remote stuff can be more reliable. The cool thing about our remote stuff is we aren't having to... Uh, send it up anywhere. It all is actually on a local network, even though it's remote. So the latency time is very low. Uh, it's able to broadcast in, in full, clean 4K, uh, really good 4K. Actually, it can. Yeah. So um, we're trying things a little differently. A lot of a lot of times when you're when you're doing remote things like that, you can just throw down a, you know, like some kind, like a live view or something, its own box, and then it goes up into the cloud and gets aggregated, comes back down, blah blah blah. There's a lot of latency in that, and and the quality kind of goes down a notch or two. Um, the way we're trying to do things and the way or the way we are doing things is uh, is very low latency, like sub second latency and uh, really, really, really clean video. So, um, yeah, I, I'm excited uh, to, to keep going. I'm really excited to keep going with it um, from Chuck Rogers. This version of of Sherpa provides uh, attitude control and communication support for dispensing the satellites. Also mentions assuring uh, spacing and separation. OK, that's see, that makes sense. So, again, they do have a separate uh, payload dispenser called Sherpa. Uh, it, that makes sense that it would have attitude control. It must, uh, if I remember right, though, I, I swear I read that it doesn't have any propulsion, so it would have to be uh, gyroscopic uh, attitude control, um, like reaction wheels. And the communication definitely makes sense, of course, having its own comm bus and all that stuff, and it can dispense satellites much later to make sure. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. Um, yeah, thanks for the reminder, Chuck, and, and maybe we actually learn a little bit more about that. Um, Edward! Uh, wow, um, Edward, again, that, Tim, you're a good man, and what you did yesterday, it wasn't about the money, I just wanted to make sure that the family knew we were thinking about them, let's have a great launch today. Edward, holy cow, you really don't need to be uh, that generous with, thank you. Jeez, uh, <laughs> I uh, thank you very much, Edward, I, I really, really, really appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate you coming back in here today again. Um, it is really insane to think. Uh, to think about the the families that have loved loved ones on the rocket, I mean that that will I, I can't even I honestly can't think about it too much because I'll, I'll I'll cry. That to me I think that's actually been uh, a dream of mine would be to I either want to be uh, pl like basically have a tree planted on top of my body so that you kind of become a tree in a sense, or flown into space. That's absolutely uh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful sentiment. But uh, Edward, thank you. Um, yes. Thank you very, very much. Like I said, still to, um, uh, yeah, I, I still, again, to, to Sean and Mandy, uh, please, please reach out if there's any way that we can help, if there's a way that we can help, uh, you know, with the hotel stays and stuff like that. Um, I know launches, I know how hard it is to schedule around a launch and how much time it takes and how much, uh, how, of course you already experienced the scrub. So, you know, it went on, but please reach out if you need any help, okay? We we are here for you, and we will take care of you. Um, Exoplanet Research says, um, I want to build uh, a, 
Uh, I want to crowdfund a spot on a rideshare and build a satellite. Think it's possible. Um, oh, first, real quick, though, everyone in chat, please say thank you to Edward because that was unbelievably generous. Again. <laughs> Again, Edward. Thank you, though. Oh, um, Exoplanet Research, you absolutely can build a satellite these days um, and, and have it be relatively affordable um, on a rideshare mission or even a dedicated, you know, a dedicated spot on an electron or something like that. I mean, you would be surprised a CubeSat and stuff like that can be done quite, quite reasonably. So um, absolutely, uh, it, it it's being done all the time and, you know, by universities and stuff like that even. So you definitely could. I've, I've wanted someday to do like an everyday astronaut some satellite, but I, I it needs to do something. It has to be something that's really cool that, that in a sense, brings space down to earth for everyday people. And I haven't quite figured out what exactly that mechanism is, but... Yeah. From the mighty Sir Woof Woof of Clan Woof more again. Um, a rum, a rapid unscheduled muting. <laughs> yeah, I don't even want to admit my error of what I of what I found out was wrong. <laughs> I don't even want to admit it. It's bad. Arvid Nilsson, uh, you are you are getting uh, too advanced with your streaming setup. This is way too advanced for me. This stuff is way outside of my wheelhouse. I've never touched broadcast uh, gear in my life, any of that switching stuff. It is completely different from anything I've ever even looked at. And uh, you know, like over here, one of the problems is I'm running the audio on a iPad. So I can just be like, hey guys, uh, I bet you can't. Hello, hello, hello. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. It provides, there's a lot of pros and cons again to hardware. But it's all only as good as the operator. And when it's just me being uh, a Dumbo, then uh, it's just me being a Dumbo. <laughs> uh, all right. We have a, a, a new membership from Kenneth. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Same with Jacob. Uh, I appreciate you guys' membership. Again, members and Patreon supporters will get exclusive live streams to exclusive live streams, period. Lately, we've been so busy. I, I do need to find a time to be able to do a January live stream. Because uh, we did one in December, we need to do one in January still. The exclusive live stream, uh, where I just it's it's normally just a, a much smaller room, and we can answer all of your questions and, and just kind of it's way more, yeah, um, it, it's just way more relaxed. So if you do want to join those live streams, consider becoming a Patreon member. Patreon.com/slash Everyday Astronaut. It's just much more intimate, and uh, yeah, we can we can talk about anything and everything, and, and we do. So uh, and just kind of getting some behind the scenes on how some of the stuff works. If you have questions about switchers or uh, the upcoming studio setup and, and like that, you know, things that were, that were constantly in the works. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's try, uh, let's check out from, um, Padrack Brady says we love technology. Well, most of the time <laughs> I love technology. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, Eric sent him to Mars again. I'm going to be probably having to name Studio B. If I get a Studio B, it'll probably just be named Mars. So thank you for sending me to Studio B. I really appreciate that. Um, let's see. This is um, this is a good question from um, Haruna. Says uh, it's not a stupid question. There's no such thing as stupid questions, especially in the world of spaceflight, because it's all quite intimidating. Yeah, but there is always a reason for something. So how um, how do they decide launching time? Do they have a given time period for launching? It depends on their destination. So a lot of times it has to do with the exact rotation of the Earth. So for these missions, if you're trying to line up with the sun so that the sun pulls on the orbit to keep it constantly aligned, uh, then you have to launch in a specific window. Uh, most missions, actually, I, I don't really know how, maybe it's because of the dog leg maneuver, they have some kind of window. They had about a 20-some minute window today. They had like a 40-minute window yesterday. There's just so many weird little considerations that honestly I don't know um, all of them. But but when you're launching east or say you're trying to get to the International Space Station to rendezvous, you do have to line up perfectly with the orbit uh, of of your your rendezvous target. You also have to line up with the phasing. So say that the say you get into orbit, but you're on the opposite side of the Earth when you're in that orbit, uh, it'll take a long time to phase and actually uh, you know match up those orbits. Like you'd have to, it it just is very inefficient. So you also have to worry about phasing as well. Uh, so all those considerations have to do with, uh, and then say you're, you're going to like a geostationary uh, transfer orbit or something, there's just certain times where, where those are more optimal and not. And the thing that you'll see with, with the Falcon 9 is it really technically, 
Although there is a launch window, as soon as they start fueling up, they are committed. They have uh, only a one second, uh, like right at T0, that's their only chance. Um, other rockets can sometimes hold right before launch and, and like push it out. Like the Atlas V can be all pressurized up and sit there uh, and, and recycle even and just kind of go back and, and try again for sometimes hours. The Falcon 9, though, once it loads up, you, once you're at T minus 35 minutes or whatever, um, you're basically committed at that point. So um, it, it is it is quite different. This is from um, iDragon. Thank you so much for the for the pair character. I appreciate that. And Mark, thank you for your tip. Um, Arvid, um, why are they calling out? Uh, f why are they calling out for locks? Isn't the rocket salmon fuel? <laughs> no, jeez. Yes. Actually, I believe it's uh, it's it's tuna. Tuna is the fuel of all rockets. Actually, it's a secret conspiracy. I don't want to get into it right now because I have to, you know, I don't want the feed to get cut out or anything. And uh, yeah, it's tuna. Uh, from uh, Yoham M says, um, how are they going to disperse all of the satellites? Uh, we'll see, I guess. Oh, cool! They have a shot. Hang on, I got to show you guys this. One second. That's a first. They have a shot of the rocket. I should just keep this up. I'll keep this up because we got... That is crazy. Huh. And that's probably because we have Go Search or whatever it is uh, as the support vessel, which has a camera on board. That's really cool. We've never seen that before. Okay. So as far as dispensing the satellites, um, they... Basically, like that Christmas tree looking corn cob thing, they'll pop off. Each one has its own dispenser. And even on top of it, that the, uh, the whatchamacallit payload uh, is its own separate dispenser. And um, it will kind of do the same type of thing where it will just have these little separation events. And so they'll be popping off all these different satellites. The Starlink satellites have that own weird deployment mechanism, which I'm guessing would have to be at the very end. So they, they deploy all of the different satellites and then spin up the stage and deploy the Starlink satellites. So, yeah. I don't exactly know with these specific, these these uh, transport missions though, because we've never seen one before. Um, Kenneth, um, had space have given up on catching the fairings? No, um, I don't know. <laughs> no, but no, I don't, they, they still seem to be wanting to catch them, but they almost exclusively are giving up on catching them, it seems like. So um, we, yeah. It, I don't know. We have seen them actually. We have seen one trying to tr trying to be caught live. It takes almost forty five minutes for them to actually come down because there's so much, uh, so there's so much more surface area and they're so lightweight that they float down really, really, really gl gradually. So they do take a while. Um, they do have, of course, the, the vessels out there to to try to grab them. Uh, go Miss Tree and Go Miss Chief. Which, by the way, I think. Hang on. I think we actually have those in the new sticker pack. Um, yeah, if you guys check this out, uh, in the recovery, yeah, we have Mystery and, and Mischief re sticker recovery pack. If you guys do, I think this this is super cool. Uh, but yeah, if you guys want to help support what I do, consider going to everydayastronaut.com. Uh, click on accessories if you want to see some fun sticker packs or some of the new um, new drinkware and stuff like that. But everydayastronaut.com slash shop. And yeah, get some cool stuff, including the fairing recovery pack, which I think is super cool. Um, yeah, that stuff always helps support me, uh, able to do what I can do here to, to make the best stream, uh, especially when I have people able to help and make these streams run more smoothly because you can have the best equipment in the world and a Dumbo operator, um, and it's not going to help too much. So, all right. Um, so, uh, I don't think they've given up, but we will see. Um, let's see. This is from Paul. Uh, thank you so much for the pair character. I appreciate that. From David. Um, hey, Tim, can you explain why the second stage MVEC engine gives off a lot less flamey stuff as compared to the first stage engines? That's a great question. Um, the biggest reason, notice at the end of the first stage burn, the, the exhaust is relatively clear. And it, it looks like, you know, you, you don't see the big orange flames. That's because it's not reacting. The carbon that's in the exhaust, there's going to be carbon in the exhaust no matter what because it's using RP-1. RP-1 has a decent amount of carbon in it, right? It's a, it's a long-chain hydrocarbon fuel. 
and there's a, a, a lot of carbon in it that of course gets ejected out the nozzle when you're when you're in like near sea level and and just in at our normal atmosphere because it's so hot it'll react with the oxygen in the air and afterburn and it will be this bright orange um, it'll keep burning in the atmosphere even after it's ejected from the engine because it's so hot it's just this burning orange carbon right um, when it gets further and further into the atmosphere there's less and less oxygen for it to react with so it actually starts to just become more and more transparent you might see a little bit of black soot um, so in space obviously by the, so by the time the first stage is, is above you know say 50 to you know 80 kilometers or something there's just not enough atmosphere to really make it glow bright orange and it just starts to be kind of this clear uh mostly clear flame and then the the uh the vacuum nozzle also the other thing it does is it lowers the pressure even more than a sea level uh nozzle so sea level nozzle you'll see spill out a ton because it's it's optimized uh it's as optimized as it can be for space but it also has to be able to survive launching at sea level if you need to know about f uh, flow separation and expansion ratios uh watch my video about aerospike engines because that's kind of the promise of aerospike engines is you can use a vacuum optimized nozzle here at sea level um but yeah the as far as the um the exhaust it's mostly what you're seeing is the lack of an after burning uh effect in the carbon so yeah all right this is um from um asborn says can't wait for mr uh mr beast dear moon announcement i really am curious he did say on twitter yesterday um that he had a big announcement coming um i i have a certain i, I definitely think he actually got chosen for dear moon which is crazy which is absolutely nuts and personally i don't care what you guys think about any youtuber period uh the influence that that some you know someone like mr beast has is almost unmatched these days you know that is easily one of the biggest youtubers for those of you that maybe don't know mr beast is is a huge youtuber um who's famous for like giving he, you know he'll do like we're gonna give away a, a house today or something um and it, it's always just absolutely nutty but his audience is is huge and extremely loyal and i personally think you know living through uh seeing him go around the moon what how that would affect the general public um beyond us spaceflight fans because all of us we already love this stuff and we just want to see more spaceflight we want to see rockets launch and stuff but there's still tons of people that have never really thought about it you know they, they don't consider it they don't dream about spaceflight and i think um you know having mr beast uh, or some other huge influencer in that sense is, is probably the best move as far... Well, first off, it doesn't matter. There's no right choice. It's all up to Yusaka Meizawa for Dear Moon to be able to choose whoever he wants to go on that vehicle. Uh, but, but, but you know, say uh, Mr. Beast versus, you know, any smaller channel, I guess. He has just a lot... Even compared to, like, say, Tom Cruise. Sure, Tom Cruise would probably get a lot of mainstream media attention, uh, which he's going to be doing probably when he starts shooting that... that uh, movie in space on a dragon capsule but sending someone like mr beast around the moon and and having him be able to bring that back to us uh will be huge will be extremely profound so yeah all right this is from uh daniel says uh thanks for all the great coverage question how far could starship fly point to point without super heavy it's about 8,000 kilometers downrange. I, I, I think Elon mentioned it once, a specific number, eight to 10,000 or something. So it can't quite go, like, can't quite go halfway around the world, but it could definitely do like transatlantic flights or some of the bigger legs. Uh, you know, for the most part, fly about as far as, as most, most airline, you know, transatlantic and airliners and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, uh, that, that seems, and th that could always be, I, I think once we get to point to point, versions of starship we'll see slight variances we'll see uh larger strakes along the side to help increase the glide ratio of it to help it extend its you know its downrange distance we could maybe see um you know a different set of engines maybe more engines maybe uh maybe less engines something you know probably more engines so they can fuel it all the way up uh i don't know i, I think that the the point to point version will be different you know i think It'll still have that cluster of three raptors in the middle, and then maybe we'll have like six more raptors or something along the ring of the outside, um, and maybe some of those super heavy the the Velociraptor versions or whatever, or the I forget what we're even calling them now, the super raptors or whatever. That'll be higher thrust, so that they can uh, you know have less gravity loss on ascent, which is where you know if you're if you're just barely eking off the pad, 
like you know say you're you're eking off the pad at 1.01 g so anything above 1 g is 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 your your accelerating uh so let's say it's 1.01 g that means 99% of your fuel is wasted in in your propulsion is just wasted canceling out gravity and you're really only of all of that rumble and all that drainage of fuel you're really only accelerating at 0.01 g so you actually get a ton of efficiency by by uh by accelerating quicker so say 1.3 g's you'd, you'd get 30 times more work done than 1.01 g if you went to 2 g's um, compared to 0.1 g you would get a hundred times the amount of work completed with the same amount of fuel assuming that the, the thrust weight ratio was was basically twice as high um, so yeah the um, I think there will be some some variations that are specific to a point-to-point -point transportation someday but again it's, it's all such a big blank slate right now that who really knows honestly uh, Terminator says um, hi Tim is there any video explaining what the aluminum foil like cover does um, on the on the Falcon 9 second stage, or can you quickly explain that? Or maybe, um, or explain that maybe. Good luck on SN9. Thank you. I'm going to need good luck on SN9. Um, it's it's basically just it's thermal blankets, just like you see, you know, on the you remember the Apollo lunar lander, how it was like covered in that gold foil. It's just a thermal blanket to keep the things on the other side of that from experiencing extreme temperatures. Um, the reason you see it pulsing and doing things is because there are also little attitude control thrusters, little little gas thrusters that help roll since the since there's only a single Merlin engine on the upper stage, um, it can't induce roll. So imagine here with me for a second that you have a cylinder and you have a single engine here. You can control your, your pitch, you can control your yaw, but to, in order to control roll, you have to have at least two engines so you can do uh, a maneuver like this to be able to induce roll or you have a secondary control system. So what it has is, is some attitude control thrusters that can that can induce roll and and do one of these numbers. Um, so you'll see that occasionally, just you know, just kind of doing little little puffs here to, to maintain the correct attitude. Um, and uh, yeah, so so you'll see that happen, and then you will see that interact with the foil occasionally. So hopefully that helps explain it. Uh, ben Carter, do you think Mr. Beast? Uh, the Mr. Beast announcement will be about Dear Moon Thoughts. Yes, sir. We did just kind of talk about that. I do kind of think that's... I, I, I think for sure that's what it is. Just he's had so many little hints. Um, so we'll see. Uh, Rob Sadler. Um, how many times have Raptor engines flown to space? Zero. Zero times. The Raptor engine has never made it above the Kármán line. The, the record altitude right now is 12.5 kilometers. So 41,000 feet. Uh, with SN8, that's the highest any Raptor engine has ever flown. So far, you know, it's only flown uh, a 20 meter hop on Starhopper, 150 meter hop on Starhopper, um, 150 meters on SN5, and 150 meters on SN6. So SN8 smashed the record by going to 12.5 kilometers. So um, big, 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 big difference. Um, yeah. So uh, has not made it to space yet. It won't probably do that until. We might see we might see a just starship only no uh, no booster cross the Carmen line. It's super arbitrary, you know. Um, but I, I could also see it maybe only going up to like sixty or seventy kilometers, turning around, accelerating back down to to really practice and experience heating. So uh, I guess we'll have to see. Matthew Duggar, uh, thank you, Tim, for what you do. How hard do you think it's going to be to catch super heavy on landing? Um, I would have said. You know, if you just think about it on face value, I would have said like impossible and really stupid and not worth trying. But the more you think about it, the more it's like, okay, SpaceX has done these wily e. coyote things all the time, right? They're constantly doing um, things like, um, you know, trying to catch fairings. And granted, the fairings may not be the best example because it hasn't turned out that reliable yet. Uh, catching the fairings has been a little bit uh, pretty hit or miss. But um, I still think that obviously they've accomplished it. They, they've at least retrieve fairings and, and reuse them often, whether or not they catch them. Um, but, you know, the booster landing itself for the, the Falcon 9 has been extremely successful. So, um, yeah, I, I think um, I think that's definitely solvable. You know, you, you want to think about the, the landing and catching mechanism almost as like the launch pad having legs as opposed to the rocket having legs. It's going to be doing the shock absorption. And it's better to do that because you can totally overbuild it on the ground. You don't have to worry about weight. You can make it easily reusable and repairable. Um, and you just have to really build it once and then hope that it's strong enough to be able to service multiple missions. Um, Chip Snyder, thank you so much. How are you doing, Chip? Good to hear from you. Um, let's see. 
Um, this is from um, Anand. Uh, will, S, will, will SpaceX broadcast SN9 launch uh, like that of SN8? We don't really know for sure, but we think they are. We, we don't know for sure, though, um, but we do think they are. All right, from Danny. Um, Hi, Tim. Thanks for the stream. Now that evacuation notices have been handed out, are you ready for a potential hop flight tomorrow? Yes, as ready as I can be. Um, w- yeah, it, it, we might have to be pulling an all-nighter then to get the actual all the real gear all set up. But uh, we'll see. We'll see. I'll, I'll be ready for it, though. Um, I promise. And I'll probably, I probably will stream longer than I did for SN8. Um, just because I almost missed like, some of the, the fuel up procedures and stuff like that. And uh, I want to be able to be here and answer all your guys' questions uh, the whole day, basically. And last time I felt like, you know, I was so worried about... Um, I, I, was, I was too worried about not trying to um, give you false hope that it was going to launch. And I realized that people, people just want to talk about SN8 or SN9 or Star Trek. They just want to talk and, and learn and listen. So um, I'm going to be on air a lot more for SN9. And uh, hopefully that also just makes sure that we, we don't miss anything because last time it was a, we were I was just yeah I think I had the wrong attitude I, I think you guys told me loud and clear that you just want me to stream period and uh, and let's just talk about Starship and so we're going to talk about Starship plenty um, this is from Robert will you cover the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope uh, of course I would I would love to see it in person I don't know if that's going to be a possibility depending on how uh, travel ends up being here in the near future uh, I would love to though, but otherwise for sure, I will definitely live stream it a hundred percent. Um, Flyboy, thank you for the membership. Uh, Mark Renau or Renauf, Renouf, uh, hi, hi, Tim. Can you please make a blooper video, including failed launch coverage and audio problems? Very entertaining. My most failed launch ever for sure was, uh, Falcon heavy air ups at six a, I had uh, a live view all set up. I was streaming. And I had this failover screen so that if I lost connection, instead of just totally dropping out, it would go to this other screen. So if, if the, the server sensed that there's nothing coming in, it played music and it had an image of Falcon Heavy upside down on the pad and saying, uh, we're experiencing technical difficulties. Uh, we'll be right back shortly. And literally it was like T minus like five, four, three, Boom, like video, the upside down rocket video feed. It was the biggest fail I've ever had by far. So definitely, if you want to, if you want to see my biggest fail, I think that was, that was it. Um, today was pretty bad, but I give myself grace on this one because there's way too many moving parts for one person to do here. Um, but yeah, I, <laughs> I have plenty of them, plenty of them. Someone should just go through and do that for me. But, um, yeah, that was, that was so funny though. Uh, this is from um, Kellorn78. Absolutely love what you're doing. Go SpaceX. Well, thank you very much, Kellorn. I, I love what I do, and I love uh, I love being able to help explain this and, and help hopefully keep you guys uh, entertained and or uh, informed as best as I can. From Rob Sadler. Uh, didn't mean Raptor engines really meant Merlin's. Oh, we keep talking about Raptors. Oops. How many times in total has a Merlin engine flown to space? Well, this was... Oh, man. They've really... They've had a... I did the math a while ago, but they've had three Falcon Heavies. They've had, um, there was four Falcon 1s where, where a Merlin made it to space. Uh, the first one did not even get to space. The other ones, I think, at least crossed the Kármán line. For sure, of course, Flight 4 and 5 did. Um, but yeah, it's the three Falcon Heavies. And then, what are we at? A hundred and, what was today? 107 launches or something. So 107 times 10, uh... Yeah, it would be uh, 1,070 plus about 28 times 3. So we're looking at about 100. We're, we're, right, we're coming up on almost 1,200 Merlins have made it to space. Um, almost, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, sorry sorry that I, I probably should have tried to figure that out. Uh, but I, yeah, so Merlins, uh, uh, around 1,200 or so. Almost. It's probably more like 1,170 or something. Uh, Greg Swanson, are you planning to come out to West Texas for any Blue Origin coverage? If so, uh, you guys can stay at my place free of charge. Well, thank you, Greg. Um, I don't know. They don't give us much warning. They don't have any press kits or press access. Um, if they started to open that up for press, like when they first fly people, uh, I would definitely have to consider it for sure. That would be awesome. I would love to do that. Um, from Neil Manthley, uh, Manthe, thank you so much. 
and from A, I appreciate it. And Brian uh, says, Tim, awesome job. Looking forward to the deployment of the five Astrocast satellites from Switzerland. They are our babies. That is awesome, Brian. Congratulations on uh, on getting five Astrocast satellites up into space today. Can't wait to see that um, successful deployment here um, shortly. That is awesome. Everyone say congrats to Brian, uh, and we're all cheering for you. So that is that is awesome. Uh, James Jameson, um, can you update? Uh, can you update on your Tesla and the story, by the way, where am I? I am in on South Pottery Island uh, with our view of Starship, although it's so stinking. Here, I'll show you what, what outside looks like. You guys have seen this view, but it's just straight fog <laughs> still. Um, that's like day three or four of literally straight fog. Um, this is part of my Tesla because uh, for those of you that don't know, I got absolutely smoked by someone uh, a, a week ago. And it uh, was very not fun to be in a car accident. I was parked. Andrew and I were both in the car. And someone coming off the beach just absolutely, they were going like 40 mile an hour trying to get off the beach and just smoked us. Um, of course, all the airbags went off. The car, uh, had it got towed this week finally on like Thursday. I'd been trying to deal with that with insurance and stuff like that. Um, the, the driver was uninsured, unregistered, and unlicensed. Uh, yay! And so I had to pay quite a bit of money out of pocket and all that stuff. It's not been fun. It's been a stressful week. So hopefully uh, the week gets better. So wish me luck, guys. <laughs> but uh, it's I haven't heard an update now that it's in the shop um, up in San Antonio. They're going to let me know, um, you know, soon here. I, I'm, I'm just hoping that <laughs> I'm just hoping it's not totaled because I know once airbags go off and and oftentimes, uh, I don't think the battery, anything, there are these little kind of crumple zones around the battery. If those even get moved a, an inch, or sorry, 2.5 <laughs> centimeters or whatever, uh, I don't know if I did that conversion even close to right, uh, then then you normally actually do, like that will total it because of a, a complete, like make sure it's safe. So we'll see, um, we will see. So yeah, so I'm, I'm still here in South Padre. I'll be here until the car is done and or uh, I'm still working on trying to figure out a Studio B. So if Studio B works out, um, depending on the timing of this whole thing, I might be down here, move stuff into the studio. Who knows? I mean, I have a feeling my car will be like weeks, like two or three weeks easy. So we will see. Um, uh, Ol how is it going, uh, Ole Mathias? I never know how to say it. Is it Ole uh, Mathias? But uh, can't wait for SN9 to fly. Check out um, our Starship slash and guide slash hop. Yes, uh, we have a few resources for you guys if you're wanting. And thank you very much. Uh, you, you did not need to tip me. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, Mathia, I mean, or Mathias, I, you do not need to tip me. Thank you so much for helping so much on the website. Jesus. Welcome so um, <laughs> I also... Oh. Just joining us, Falcon 9 lifted off at 10 a.m. Eastern from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Had successful stage separation. We landed our first stage on our drone ship for the fifth time and successfully completed our first second stage burn. On screen right now is a view of the second stage MVAC engine. We are waiting to relight that engine for the second and final burn. Uh, this burn will be a quick one, lasting only two seconds. That's crazy. A and we're expecting burn. that burn to start uh, in just a few seconds here. And if we don't have footage of it, we should be able to get confirmation over the, the nets. Looks like they just finished it. Oh, here it is. Nice and short. And there is second wow. engine start off, uh, start up, and then oh, I love that cut shot. off. The lox tank. We don't see that often. We're not really supposed to see that. That was the lox tank. Now we're a waiting for confirmation inside. of a good orbit on that second stage. Nominal payload orbit insertion. And there's the call out that we want. Uh, that is a confirmation of a good orbit. Next up will be the deployment of our 133 spacecraft on board the mission, which will occur over an 18 minute period. And as a reminder, today's mission is the first dedicated small sat rideshare program mission. We created this program to provide small satellite operators with regularly scheduled rides on board Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, and in the not too distant future, Starship as well. These missions offer competitive pricing to our customers as well as an increased, uh, as well as increased flight opportunities and flexibility. 
As part of this program, we are also offering traditional rideshare opportunities on existing low Earth orbit missions and on SpaceX's Starlink missions, which provide launch opportunities about once a month. That's awesome. The first of those deployments should be happening around the T plus 58 minute and 30 second mark. There's a view of the transporter one payload containing all 143 spacecraft. So once once we get deployment here and there's a little time, I want to go back and show you guys that lock. For stage. today's ride shares, there are 11 ports on our payload, payload, payload adapter responsible for sending 133 spacecraft plus our 10 Starlink satellites uh, into orbit. Some of these ports will have multiple deployments. Uh, for these, over the countdown nets, we'll hear callouts for when the deployment sequence has begun and another callout for when the deployment sequence has completed. There are also then a handful of ports that will deploy only once, and we'll try to let you know who the customer is for each deployment, along with how many spacecraft are being sent into space. This is going to be nuts. <laughs> I would not want to be the mission planner for this one. So, yeah, again, there's going to be 130. We're just over a minute away from the first set of deployments. Due to the nature of the payload stack, we will not have visuals for every deployment, but we do hope to catch most of them with our two camera views. It's also worth noting that uh, we will lose access to ground station coverage for a short period during the 18 minute deployment sequence. And when we, when we reach that point, we'll let you know uh, over the webcast. But there's some people holding their breath right now for sure. First up, the deployment sequences for port C4 and C1 will be initiated at the T plus 58 minutes and 30 second mark. On port C4, there are 36 planet super doves, and then there are 17 spacecraft aboard Kepler's port on port C1. Hopefully we don't lose video feed on this. They are, they might not be near a ground track station, so we might lose video feed occasionally. That's okay. And we're hoping to get or C4 and C1 deployment sequences initiated. Those call outs. The deployment sequence has started for 36 of Planet Super Doves on port C4, as well as the 17 spacecraft aboard Kepler's port on C1. Uh, we're expecting these deployments to conclude about 11 minutes from now. Uh, in just a few seconds, we should be starting up the deployment for our customer Maverick, which contains three CubeSats for NASA's small spacecraft technology program's VR3X mission. It's going to be Jeez. deploying from the aft end fuel dome, which essentially is a small platform mounted on the back end of the second stage fuel dome right above the MVAC engine. Aft end payload deployed. And there you heard the call outs. Three CubeSats aboard Maverick's Mercury dispenser have deployed. These are for NASA's well, small spacecraft technologies program VR3X mission. The next call out will be to start deployment sequence for our customer NanoRacks around the T plus one hour and eight minute mark. And while we wait for this deployment sequence to begin, we're going to leave you with views of the deployments for Planet and Kepler. And we'll see you back here at the T plus one hour and seven minute mark. Gosh. Honestly, I, I do not envy the people that <laughs> had to figure out how to do all these deployments. I mean, that is crazy. This is going to be impressive. Uh, to say the least. <laughs> so uh, we've got quite a few more questions to help answer for you guys. Um, all right, so um, this is, this is, oh, let me turn the music down. Okay, so this is a question we see quite often. Uh, Mark, uh, why is SpaceX disassembling SN12 without testing it? So we're not gonna see 12 or uh, 12, 13, or 14 fly. SN12, there were parts for SN12, SN13, and 14, a few parts. Um, but the they're old. 
they're old, outdated hardware already. You know, don't forget, because the, the biggest thing they're working on, and it might not be the most efficient use of their resources necessarily right now, is they're working on the manufacturing process. Um, so they're building more than they might even fly, right? They're, they're literally learning how to build. And when they're learning how to build, the result of the flight is, an, and they, they have a backlog of, of rockets that already need to fly, right? So we're seeing SN9 try to fly. We have SN10 ready to go in the, in the high bay. We have the booster being built in the high bay, booster number one. We have um, SN11 in the mid bay and then SN15 in the mid bay. SN15 is a pretty substantial upgrade. So they're gonna wanna see that thing fly to validate a lot of their changes. Otherwise, you're just, you're flying hardware that might be flawed and are suboptimal and not the newest designs. And what's the point at that point? You know, if you've proven, if they prove they can land with, you know, SN9 or 10 or 11, and they are ready to get into those higher regime things and things that require more, uh, a more advanced, more high fidelity uh, next generation rocket, then uh, then why even bother flying 12, 13, 14? Because right now they're, they're all just wasting time on the pads. The, the they're having a hard time getting these things off the pad in under a month. You know, we, I was hoping to see um, SN9 fly within a month of SN8. I'm guessing that hopefully now, um, because SN9 had so many issues, that hopefully SN10 can roll out and fly really, really quickly. Uh, definitely within a month. Don't forget, SN9 we saw a problem with it being tipped over in the high bay. We also saw it uh, have to get two Raptors swapped out. It also got punished extra hard with the triple... Uh, static fire day so um, I would expect that SN10 could roll out immediately and just start really really increasing the cadence and hopefully uh, soon thereafter at some point I actually have a better studio oh, option than a hotel room <laughs> uh, Ben Roberts hi Tim slightly off topic but are you familiar with the blue shift aerospace uh, they'll be using biofuel and the rockets when they can launch I am not familiar with blue shift aerospace but that is cool uh, bio rockets Biofuel is, is awesome. That is very cool. I'll have, to, I'll have to see if I can find some info on them. Um, Gav O'Toole says, Hey, Tim, I've never been so informed about space and anything to do with space, and you're always my first place to watch any launch. Uh, launches just ordered a full flow stage T-shirt. Can't wait to get it in the post. That is awesome. Thank you so much for your support, Gav. I really do appreciate that. Uh, it is it is my pleasure. Again, this is just I, I love this stuff. And uh, how can you not be excited about it? But I understand that, you know, this stuff can be extremely intimidating and it's hard to sometimes find a good place to start. Um, so that's what I want to help provide you guys with is the resources to at least get started um, and not, you know, and, and help you get the gears turning and the key, get that curiosity sparked because it's, it's exciting stuff. So thank you very much, Gav. Um, um, Andy A says, hey, Tim, thanks for the awesome coverage. Does the Falcon 9 engine chill with locks? Throw off the fuel. Uh, mixing during burn. Also, do SpaceX and Blue Origin uh, use the same uh, pyro uh, pyrofit pyrophytic material for their? Oh, sorry, it's py pyrophoric. Um, yeah, just slightly uh, misspelled there, but yeah, same pyrophoric material for their ignition. I don't know exactly what Blue Origin does for for ignition. It is quite common to use TTEB, triethyl aluminum, triethyl boring. It's pyrophoric, so when it comes in contact with oxygen. It, it, it spontaneously combusts and, and begins a stable combustion and then you can add your fuel to that basically as far as does it throw off the locks um, fuel mixing during burn so they account for this they literally account for how long do we have to do um, engine chill down because they literally do run you know locks through the lines and everything how long are we going to be doing that and how much are we venting how much are we losing and, and they obviously account for every little bit of that. And the as far as the mixture inside the combustion ratio, or inside the main combustion chamber, uh, those won't the the ratios for that won't change until they open up the main fuel valves, the main combustion chamber valves. So um, once once those are open, anything that happened before doesn't really matter, except for how much they drained out of the tanks. Is my understanding. Um, I I might be uh, I might be a little off on. It. Oh yeah, I did want to show you guys the locks tank here really quick. Let's scroll back just a little bit. And see if we can find that shot of the locks tank is right after um, engine shut off. So Once let's see here. The board, we create the board bit version confirmation of a good orbit on that font. Uh, uh, there it is. Okay. And there is second engine start so, off. So uh, start there off. we go. So this, you're looking inside of the locks tank, the liquid oxygen tank. You are seeing. 
locks, you'll notice it's all settled at the bottom right now because it was just going under acceleration. So um, obviously in space, when when there's uh, when everything's in relative motion to each other, you are experiencing zero g. Um, you're still experiencing you're still being pulled down by gravity, but your your forward velocity kind of cancels out the the chance of you ever hitting the earth but everything in your relative frame of of motion is all moving in the same so when the engine stops running um, when the engine's running all that fuel gets pushed down into the bottom when it stops running it just kind of will start doing whatever it wants to do just kind of free floating so we can actually see it um cut off begin to do that so let me rewind again here let me i'm going frame by frame so yeah you can kind of see it beginning to lift off of the bottom of the the bottom of the tank you can also see some things here um these big things on the side are likely baffles to make sure there's not sloshing um in the stage while it's while it's firing and stuff like that so to make sure there aren't any big jolts of you know you know anything like this if it's sloshing you can actually get um you can run into a lot of issues a lot of different issues um in, including having it rock back and forth or inducing some kind of um uncontrollable situation or you can have phase change issues there's a lot of things that can happen um but yeah this is just a fun cool shot there are lights inside the tanks that's why we're able to see this these are normally engineering cameras we're really not supposed to see it <laughs> don't tell anybody of course i still love you and okay. our second stage had two successful engine burns so far, the deployment sequence has begun for 36 of planet's CubeSats, as well as the 17 spacecraft aboard Kepler's port. If you're looking closely at the left half of your screen, you should see them in the background uh, being deployed from the payload. Uh, we're expecting those to be completed around the T plus one hour and nine minute mark. We've also deployed three CubeSats for our customer Maverick. We're now waiting to hear that the deployment sequence has started from port C3 for the nine spacecraft for NanoRack's Ear Ease 1 mission. All right, so we got more to deploy. And while we're waiting for that call out, uh, the white dot on the left hand side of the screen, that is the moon. It's a pretty hmm. cool shots of uh, the moon there. That is cool. Now, people might be tempted to ask, um, you know, why don't we see stars in this image? Um, oh, there's some, some, because, you know, you're in space. Why aren't there stars? Oh. Um, confirmation from the team for the nine spacecraft for NanoRax. Ear sequence initiated. Ease one mission. And there is the confirmation uh, for the nine spacecraft. Uh, we're expecting to get confirmation that these have completed deployment in about eight minutes from now, once we pass through our ground station blackout period. So stay tuned for that. Also signal Bangalore as expected. Next up, we're expecting C4, to get C4, the confirmation C4, that the 36 of Planet's Super Doves have deployed, as well as the 17 spacecraft aboard Kepler's port. Sweet. And uh, we did get that call out. So far, we've successfully deployed 56 of our 133 small sat ride shares today. Nine spacecrafts have started their, their deployment sequence and should wrap up in the next few minutes, leaving another 68 still yet to be initiated. We've now entered that blackout period I mentioned earlier, which means we lose camera views and telemetry. During this time, we are expecting quite a bit of activity, but we won't get confirmation of successful deployments until we regain ground station connectivity around the T plus one hour and 15 minute mark. Uh, here's a preview of what will be happening until uh, we regain that connectivity. Nine spacecraft for NanoRax will complete their deployment sequence. Uh, the first of two ports for our customer ExoLaunch will start and then finish deploying from port B3. Their second port, B2, will also begin its deploy sequence, but won't be completed until approximately T plus one hour and 16 minutes. Exolaunch has a total of 30 spacecraft on today's mission. From there, two spacecraft will deploy for our customer Capella from two separate ports. And lastly, Spaceflight Incorporated customer IQPS's satellite will also separate. And while we wait to regain access to ground station coverage in a few minutes, sit back and follow along with our animation that shows you where we're at in the mission. We'll see you back here at the T plus one hour and 15 minute mark. Okay, so again, I, I wanted to uh, kind of talk about why you wouldn't see stars in those images. Um, the, the, you can tell that obviously the moon was, was fairly bright. You know, the moon is in general substantially brighter than any star, period. 
Um, but the spacecraft has lights on it, and, and, it's, and it's illuminating those lights. And especially when it's in the daylight, you'll see big time, you know, that the sun is illuminating the spacecraft. Um, the camera still has the same exposure ideas as here on Earth, you know. So um, here on Earth, if you are to try to take a picture in daylight, in the amount of light that we have now, you need a small aperture or and or a high shutter speed and or a low ISO. Otherwise, it'll just be a white screen. And opposite of that, when it's nighttime and you want to take pictures of the stars, you have to have a large aperture opening. You have to have a high ISO and or you have to have a long shutter speed. Just because you're in space doesn't mean that those um, lights necessarily get brighter per se. Um, th there is, of course, less atmospheric occlusion. There's less things like, you know, right now during the daytime, the whole uh, the, the atmosphere does scatter light a lot for us. Um, the cool thing, though, is in space, because the light doesn't get scattered like this and it doesn't illuminate everything and totally wash out the stars, you could expose your photographs um, in daylight to take pictures of stars. The only problem is anything that is illuminated by, say, the sun or illuminated by a secondary light source or something um, would be completely washed out. So when you're trying to get an image of your payloads or an image of your, your satellites and stuff, um, you, you can't get the two to be in the same exposure. There's not enough dynamic range. Just like our lights, just like our eyeballs, you know, when, when it's really, really bright and you're used to that, your pupils shrink down. And then if you run inside and go into a, you know, a, a dark room or something, uh, it'll be pitch black. You stay there long enough, your pupils open up, and it's no big deal, and you can see in that room fine, but then if you run back outside, you're going to be like, ah, squinting like crazy. Um, it's the same thing. The cameras have even a smaller dynamic range than, our, than the human eye. The human eye has a, or an amazing dynamic range. Our brain actually, it's not necessarily the eye, but our brain fills in. <gasps> oh, they got them on the deck already, but I don't think they caught either of them. That's cool, though. Those are the fairings having been retrieved already. That's fast. <laughs> That is fast, but but our brain fills in a lot of the information for us. It's not to say that our eyes are are magical. Um, cameras are getting pretty stupid good at that stuff too, at having high dynamic range. You may, may have heard that term HDR, high dynamic range. Um, so yeah, you could absolutely get an image like this where you see stars and stuff like that. Uh, but then your spacecraft, or if you're you know if the Earth is below or something, will just be completely blown out. And then people are like, why is it all just white? You know, so uh, you can't have it both ways really. Um, but yeah. Hopefully that helps answer that question. Um, Hackman P, send Tim to, to Studio Boca Chica in Mars Fund. I really appreciate that, Hackman. Um, you definitely, you definitely need to. Uh, I hope that you guys are ready because I promise that my time down here is never idle. I I don't have uh, idle time. I almost I took a whole night off the other night though. Uh, almost a whole night off. It was amazing. <laughs> I did not touch anything work for like four hours before bed, and it was great. But meanwhile, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of moving parts down here that I'm working on. And um, some of them are going to be very, very, very big. I can't wait to tell you guys about it. Um, Discord, we'll, we'll probably be talking about some of them. Um, and Patreon supporters, we'll, we'll be talking about some of those things for sure. But there's even some other things that I'm still working on that are even more behind the scenes. So thank you very much for the support. Uh, Jeff James, Mars has two moons orbiting around it, known as Fomos and Deimos. Fear and dread. Is Musk a supervillain? Absolutely. We, of course he's a supervillain. He he digs tunnels and is launching rockets. I mean, of course he's a supervillain. <laughs> That's awesome, Jeff. Uh, Chris Silver, Tim, if you want to send a satellite, you can look into the Humanity Star passive satellite disco ball for humans uh, to look up and be amazed. That's uh, The Humanity Star was, yeah, Rocket Lab's first, uh, on, on their first orbital missions, they launched the Humanity Star. Um, I thought that was cool for sure, but I, I and, but I definitely want something that like actually. I, I don't I don't know I don't know what I want yet for for an artificial satellite, but yeah, good call, Chris. I I definitely am thinking about it. Uh, True Northalt just had the idea to, uh, to get even better landing shots on the drone ship. What if they had a drone that flew out before the rocket landed? Would be beautiful. Deploying 133 small sats for commercial and government customers. We're expecting to reconnect with the ground station in just a few seconds, and we should be hearing calls for the deployments um, that we didn't see. And these calls should be happening back to back once we reconnect. Uh, during this blackout period, we also were able to recover both fairing halves, um, and they are safely on board our ships. And the callouts for the satellite should be happening around the T plus one hour and one hour, 15 minutes and 50 second mark. 
Um, we will we will be talking about the drone flying out before the rocket once we know that I'm not going to be talking over anybody. Um, I, okay, I'll start talking about it now, and I'll probably. Acquisition signal, it. Cordova. Here we go. We'll get a downlink any second. There we go. Deployment is confirmed on ports C3, B3, C5, B1, and C6. Port B2, deployment sequence initiated and confirmed. That's good. So we did get co some confirmations. We should have some more callouts happening in just a few seconds here, and I'll summarize once all of the callouts are done. Oh, cool. That was a big one. Port A4 deployment confirmed. That's nuts. Port A2 deployment confirmed. Just yeeting out all the satellites there. Gently, gentle yeeting. Hopefully we hear Port B2 level. deployment sequence complete. So anyway, uh, as far as flying a drone off of the drone ship, get the shot of the um, rocket landing. It sounds like we've gotten all the callouts. I'm going to go ahead and recap all the different ports. So from port C3, the Nanorax Ear Ease 1 missions 9 payloads have deployed. From port B3 and B2, the Exoport 1 spacecraft deployed with two ice eye radar imaging satellites aboard. And Exoport 2 with 28 spacecraft from the DLR ice eye nano avionics swarm and TU Dresden began its deployment. From port C5 and C6, deployed one small sat each for our customer Capella. From port B1, the Spaceflight Incorporated customer's IQPS satellite has also deployed. And from port A4, SpaceX, uh, Space Flight Incorporated's Sherpa F FX1 spacecraft has deployed with its 13 spacecraft on board. From port B2, the final small sats for Exo Launch have now deployed, making for a total of 30 on today's mission. And from port a2 deorbits pulse mission with its 20 spacecraft on board has also deployed. Uh, and that will conclude the rideshare portion of the mission. With these deployments behind us, we are now going to enter another short coast, fit coast phase before deploying our 10 Starlink satellites. So sit tight, enjoy the music, and we'll be back at the T plus one hour and 30 minute mark. We'll see you then. Okay. So. Uh, why don't they, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm going to answer or start this with, why don't they just have a drone? And if you, if you don't watch the, the podcast that I already uh, talked about earlier, oh, um, our ludicrous feature that I do each week, each week we answer, oh, why don't they just like, why don't they just do a drone ship? Or why don't they just, you know, catch the, use parachutes or why don't they just, uh, you know, recover a second stage or something like that. You know, every week we do a, why don't they just, and, and we answer your, your Twitter questions and stuff like that. So if you, you definitely should be watching our ludicrous future. That's O L F pod.com. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll be answering why don't they just, and we've answered this one before. Um, specifically, why not a drone? It still comes back to the, you know, yes, you could fly like a, a, a DJI mini or something like that, but don't forget the support vessels are 10 miles away, 16 kilometers away. They're outside of an exclusion zone. Um, getting good telemetry, you'd have to take off from there. You don't want to take off because you, you know, obviously you have to control it. You don't want to take off from from the deck. You'd be you wouldn't be able to control it. You know, uh, and the reason you can't control it is quite literally the curve of the Earth, right? So you could go up a little bit from you know from a support ship, fly out you know a decent amount, but there really aren't any decent drones that have um, that kind of range yet. I mean, you can get, you're, they're getting up there. Some of the DJI stuff with some of the, the new connectivity uh, suites have like maybe six mile range, 10 or 10 kilometer range. Um, they're getting really good, but 
if you have anything that could potentially risk losing control and crashing into the rocket or even having the rocket for some reason um, have any kind of signal inter interference or radar interference or anything like that, like, is it worth risking a $15 million booster uh, and, and its safety and its landing so you can get a pretty drone shot? The answer conclusively is no. I mean, uh, I do still think someday they could fly, um, you know, it might be worth it to fly up uh, and, and get, you know, up to your, your ceiling and uh, and have a, a longer lens, you know, even like a, a DJI Inspire uh, 2 with, say, like an X3 camera on it, which is Micro Four Thirds. You can fly about a 150 millimeter lens on there if you weigh the back end of it down. But again, is it is it worth it? Is it actually adding anything? Um, they probably could do that, but uh, is, is that really that worth it, you know? Um, yeah, I, I've, talked, I've talked about this quite a bit, um, but it all just comes down to time effort and uh and the risk because there is a risk involved in flying another another vehicle at all anywhere near a rocket like that so um peter sloth says uh what do you think about using decommissioned oil platforms as uh, a base for sea launch and using the facilities as passenger hubs as well pros and cons i think it makes a ton of sense which is why we're literally seeing it um it's going it makes a ton of sense those things are dirt cheap once you know cheaper you can make money buying them and scrapping them for the raw material because they're they're so useless once, especially as we're transitioning out of this era of sending out a nearly billion dollar oil. Think about this. Nearly a billion dollar oil platform uh, is how much it costs to build one of those in the first place. It goes out, it pokes a big hole in the, in the ground and, and sucks up oil, right? Um, and then when it's at the end of its life, uh, if they can't find another place to, to drill or anything, when it's done, they just scrap it, right? So obviously it makes a ton of sense to, uh, to just repurpose that. You know, you have a lot of infrastructure there. You have a lot of the support and the, the physical, the physical, uh, you know, it's, it needs to be able to support a lot of weight on a lot of, uh, a lot of just everything. It just needs to be huge. And these things are huge. Uh, the cool thing about a, an oil platform, as far as public perspective is they're really the deck is already really tall and my biggest fear is that if they start launching out at sea especially from here uh you know boca chica if they fly out or if they do this more than say 15 miles away you're going to start losing everything over the over the horizon um i really want to see these launches I, I hope that people can line the beach and see the world's largest rocket and most powerful rocket flying um so hopefully it only goes about 12 to 15 miles out at sea parks there and then of course because it's an elevated platform already you know the, the deck of that thing is is a good um you know 30 40 meters off the ground plus it has a huge launch tower you know and the vehicle sitting on top of it's going to be 120 plus meters tall so hopefully you can still pretty easily see it from even 15 miles away but oh man uh yeah as far as pros and cons i mean it just makes sense cheap and readily available and just repurpose it and make it happen that's my opinion Justin Rowland, um, hello from Clearwater, Kansas. What happens to the second stage uh, if the second stage does not like? Keep up the awesome work. Love the channel. Well, Justin, that would be a loss of mission. Absolutely, especially uh, especially at second stage at stage separation. If the second stage doesn't light, it's going to fall back to Earth just like the first stage. Um, the first stage, of course, they're both in space. You're getting to space. The first stage gets into space. But in order to get to space, you just have to go up. It's ar pretty arbitrary. You're just going up until there's no discernible atmosphere, and then you're in space, right? Space is just an environment. And we define it as uh, 100 kilometers in altitude or 62 miles in altitude. This is the Kármán line. So if you go up and cross the Kármán line and you're going straight up, you're going to fall straight back down, just like Blue Origin's New Shepard. Um, now, in order to stay in space, you have to get into orbit. You have to get up to orbital velocity so that you're going sideways as fast as gravity is pulling you back down. So you're always just basically falling over the horizon. You know, you're, you're, you're going forward at the same speed as you're going down, right? That's exactly what orbital velocity is, um, or as, as you're being pulled down. Now, uh, if the second stage does not light at stage separation, it'll literally just follow the first stage and land and, and burn up and, and explode about, uh, five or 600, kilometers downrange or wherever the drone ship is basically it'll be right in that same vicinity now if it doesn't do the relight you just won't be in your proper orbit and that sometimes isn't there's sometimes we can have partial mission success where some of the payloads it doesn't really matter they can be in that uh, initial parking orbit 
and it's not like it's not ideal like sometimes CubeSats and stuff some of these some things that that don't need to be in a very specific orbit they're just kind of testing some things in space it doesn't really matter where they are um sometimes it's not a big deal but for other things the exact orbit is the only thing that matters if you're not getting into that sun synchronous orbit it's a failed mission so the answer is it'd be a failed mission all right from um uh, massimo thank you so much let's see uh this is from uh suri van says uh what happens to the second stage after deploy will it still be in orbit no for low earth orbit missions they save a little bit of fuel they will literally basically turn the booster the second stage around and they'll do a small deorbit burn and actually slow down and and deorbit itself so that it doesn't contribute to space debris you can see it by the way look at this ground track it's flying over greenland right now coming up over uh canada that's pretty awesome uh from from uh dzac one if studio b is mars then maybe studio b can be earth the everyday astronaut regular transmission home or something else that's a good idea man you guys are good at, at acronyms i am terrible at them uh that's the everyday everyday astronaut regular transmission home that's i like that that's great will earth and mars for sure that totally makes sense and maybe we'll have to find someday a, a studio space in say florida or something and that, and that could be the moon or something or Luna or something like that. That'd be awesome. Uh, Mike Crop. Hey Tim, what's your top ten? Uh, what's your top of wait, your top ten of best space movies series? Also, how excited are you for S and I? And keep it up. Thank you, Mike. Um, top. I don't know if I have a full ten to just list off. Um, I do really like The Martian. Is probably one of my favorites as far as a movie because it's so uh, accurate. You know, it, it's realistic. It, it's it's just great. It's brilliant. It's hilarious. Um, definitely one of my favorites. Um, I really like Interstellar. I really like, um, you know, I grew up as a Star Wars fan, but those don't really count uh, as space movies. Sorry. If, if, you, if you're just walking around on the Millennium Falcon, eh, I don't know. I, I don't love sci-fi like that. I, I like, it needs to be a little bit, it's fairly rooted in like our current reality for me to really, uh, really get along with it. But as far as, um, well, When We Left Earth is still one of my favorite series. I think you can buy it on like, you know, Apple iTunes and stuff and like Amazon maybe. Uh, but When We Left Earth was an awesome Discovery Channel series that is uh, like a six-part series starting from the beginning of NASA all the way up through uh, the last space shuttle missions basically. And it was – it's really well done. Um, that's definitely, definitely good. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. It, there's a lot out there. There's there's a lot of things. The, the Challenger – uh, documentary on Netflix was incredible like really 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 well done um, I like this documentary called the engines that came from the cold there's some things that they get just flat out wrong where they gloss over big time about uh, the Soviet engines um, yeah like big big time wrong but um, I can forgive them because it's still shot really well and it has um, Glushko and things like that uh, I think Glushko uh, is, is interviewed in there but um, it has a lot of really cool key players uh, from the, the former Soviet Union uh, seeing their engines be tested in the United States for the first time. So it's really cool. Uh, yeah, Apollo 11 is, is phenomenal. Definitely, definitely up there, actually. Um, but yeah. Um, Massimo, thank you so much for your, your tip again. Uh, Gabrielle Taylor, Mr. Beast definitely deserves it. I agree when you have that kind of influence and he just seems like, you know, he seems like such a good guy that... Um, I, I'd be really, I'd be really happy to see him do that. I think it'd have a huge impact, especially on a younger audience. He has such a, a loyal young audience that I think that'd be so impactful. Uh, Flyboy, hi Tim. I'm an uh, astrophotographer. What's your opinion on the impact Starlink is going to have while imaging, or will uh, will we not notice the difference? Um, if you are so, uh, first off, good question. Um, as far as the impact on astro, an amateur astrophotographer, um, or or professional even. Obviously, you know, the best time to take pictures is in actual midnight is, you know, is when the sun's on the opposite side of the earth. When the sun's on the opposite side of the earth, it cannot illuminate Starlink satellites. So you just physically will not see them just like any other satellite. Um, oh. mission, which launched this morning from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida at 10 a.m. Eastern. We then had two successful ignition 
ignitions and shutdown of the second stage Merlin vacuum engine, then successful deployment of our 133 spacecraft for our commercial and government customers. We were also able to successfully recover our first stage for a fifth time on our drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You, and recover both fairing halves from the water. Coming up, we'll have the deployment of our 10 Starlink satellites. It's going to be the first set of Starlink satellites deployed to a polar orbit, and that should be happening in about 30 seconds. And there is a view of the second stage. That right there is a view of the Starlink satellites to the right-hand side. So they actually spin it. They basically yaw it. It looks like, like we this. lost a signal on the second stage. Flat. Hopefully we can get that back. If we don't have views of the second stage, we should get confirmation via the callouts of deployments of those starting satellites. Yeah, I'm not sure will it, where they will do the deorbit burn, but it'll likely be in the same. They, they'll target probably the same. They might wait a couple orbits, uh, and so that partial data up, back from New Hampshire, so that it uh, lines up with the Indian Ocean where they normally do the deorbit burns. Oh, there goes Starlink. And there goes the ten Starlink satellites, the first set to go to a polar orbit. Uh, with that, with those ten, that is 143 spacecraft deployed on a single mission, the most ever. <laughs> Uh, pretty awesome. Uh, with that said, that will be bringing our webcast to an end. We would like to thank all of our rideshare customers for their support on today's mission. We'd also like to thank the United States Air Force for range support, as well as the Federal Aviation Administration for licensing. Continue to follow us on SpaceX.com for future missions and milestones, as well as our Twitter and Instagram profiles. And if you are excited about what you've seen today and want to join our team, visit SpaceX.com slash careers to learn more about working at SpaceX. Thank you to all of our viewers for your continued support and have a wonderful rest of the day. Yay, huge congratulations. That is massive. Hang on, I gotta go switch this real quick. Give me one second, guys. All right, so that looked awesome. I can't believe that worked so well. I, I can believe it worked so well. I feel like that's 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 in their wheelhouse, no problem. So, um, okay, so impact on Starlink having images um, for, for an amateur or just for astrophotography, it should not be affected at all. And of course, if it is, you can always do negative stacks. You can stack and remove streaked images. You already have to do that with planes anyway and stuff like that. So um, that's already kind of part of the, the toolkit that most astrophotographers utilize. Um, but as far as, uh, you know, if, if it's at night and you're taking pictures, full-blown night, like not dusk, not, you know, the two hours after sunset or two hours before sunrise, um, those conditions, you just won't see Starlink satellites. Now, it could have an, it does have an effect on um, radio, potentially on, on radio uh, astronomy and, and even uh, nighttime, you know, visual astronomy as well, because you know, you can still have a Starlink satellite streak through your image and, and cover, you know, if you're just covering this tiny little spot in the sky, there's a chance that you have a Starlink satellite fly through it in the middle of an observation, and it would be disruptive. Uh, there's going to be things to mitigate that. There's going to be, uh, it's not, it's not ideal. It's, it's absolutely not ideal for the, uh, full, the full, full blown ground based astronomy world. It's, uh, Starlink is not great. Um, they're working with them to try to make it better, and hopefully we just get more and more space-based observations uh, in the very near future. But there may be some touch-and-go gray times there for the next decade where, it's, where it is compromised, and that is just the reality of it. Uh, Malway2 uh, Malway says, wondering what a dedicated rideshare would look like with the Starship. SpaceX could easily place 1,000 or 2,000 small satellites in just one launch. Um, and let's read your other one here. Uh, and considering the reuse of the second stage and the price of methane, it would be extremely cheap to put a load on this launch, right? Yes, absolutely. When 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 Starship starts launching, it's going to just be game changing. Period. You know, and if they're launching at the frequency they want to launch at, too, um, you know, if the if a Starship really does launch for like a million dollars, which uh, is what Elon wants to do, even if it launches for ten million dollars, the amount of uh, <laughs> satellites they could launch on a single payload on a single launch is just going to be bonkers just plain and simple bonkers um so we will see um yeah that'll be game changing 
Uh, Massimo says, what's what's probability for a Falcon 9 to crash a satellite? Um, almost zero. Um, I, I, I can't say zero, but darn near zero. Um, oh, by the way, yeah, if... if if you guys want to know when the Falcon 9 or the SN9 is going to launch, Starship SN9, I saw people asking just now, uh, go to whenlaunch.com, W-E-N, not W-H-E-N, whenlaunch.com, because everyone's asking when launch um, and when hop. I'd say this is beyond a hop. This is now a launch. Um, Star Hopper, sure, SN5, these are launches. These are, uh, we don't call, at least I don't call Blue Origin stuff hops. I would call those launches. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, when whenlaunch.com. And you can you'll get all of our updates on when we think it's going to be launching. It, it might be launching as early tomorrow. Uh, so probability they, they they know all that. They know their corridors. They know where other satellites are. Um, and all those all big satellites are tracked. It's actually really 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 hard to run into something in space. Just imagine uh, imagine if me for a second that you have two. Let's just pretend that you have two um, interstates that cross or two highways crossing. And let's say you have two cars coming at each other at uh, at, at one kilometer an hour, just crawling, each of them will be in that intersection for a long period of time. There's a pretty high probability if they leave around the same time, you know, they both will be in the intersection at the same time. Now say, you know, and, and say you have like a 10 kilometer track or something, you know, and it takes them 10 kilometers to get to that intersection. Now let's say you're going a thousand kilometers an hour. If you're even like 0. 0.2 seconds different, one will go through the intersection before the other one. Now say you're going... 28,000 kilometers an hour, each satellite will only be in that intersection for a teeny tiny fraction of time. Like hard to even conceive how little amount of time that satellite will be in that, in that exact space where, where it would potentially run into something else. Just because orbits cross does not mean that you're going to run into something. Not only that, you also aren't in, it's not 2D. Orbits are 3D. So you have altitudes, you know, you could be one could be cruising by, I mean, the odds of actually hitting a satellite and, and taking a satellite down are, are hard. Like, you have to try really hard and, and use a lot of advanced technology to actually even make that happen in the first place. Um, and, and it's controversial when you do because you end up with a ton of space debris. We saw that happen a couple years ago. Um, ISRO tested a, a satellite uh, demolition technology, basically. And it, it's, it's hard to do. Intercepting a satellite is really hard to do. So um, with the probability near zero. Uh, Greg Beasley Jr. Speaking of the point-to-point -point Starship, do you think our regulatory agencies will allow SpaceX to be both manufacturer and service provider, given they didn't allow it with airlines? Well, there. I mean, I think it's 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 different because right now they're allowing them to be, uh, you know, they're allowing to be the manufacturer and the service provider for 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 space launching. Um, I don't know anything about the the regulatory system that that put it in place for the airlines in the first place but uh i i, I think we're going to be starting on a different page here with these in general so um i i don't know what that will exactly look like maybe if it falls t into faa wanting it to be more airliner like they'll have to be a separate provider but i i don't actually know uh, milan says hi tim have you considered setting up the mars studio on a boat so you can watch phobos and demos launch send him to the sea we've absolutely been already talking about what the best option is when these things start launching at sea, um, we're, we're, we're trying everything. <laughs> uh, Paula's plane says the Norwegian lacks, f uh, fisk means salmon fish have fun, man. PS not locks. Well, thank you very much, Paulus. I appreciate that. Um, Alaskan says, uh, what do you think will be the nearest term interstellar spacecraft laser sails, nuclear fusion, nuclear pulse? I think the laser sails are, pretty promising for a in inter, uh, stellar, flyby mission it actually makes quite a bit of sense the only problem is you're also waiting on the speed of light to get your transmissions back so even something that's four light years away say you can get it up to let's say let's say you can get up to 25 percent the speed of light using a a giant sail and then giant lasers here on earth or in space or whatever to to basically continually propel it and it, it ends up being uh averaging to 25 percent the speed of light uh, that'd be, you know, 16 years to get there and then another four years to get the, the data back. So you're look, looking at a 20 years just to be able to fly to the nearest system, which is kind of insane, honestly. Um, all right, let's keep going here. Uh, John, thank you so much, John. I appreciate it. Good to hear from you. Uh, Carrie Saylor says, um, why wouldn't SpaceX attempt to catch a Falcon 9 first stage before attempting um, super heavy? Keep up the awesome work. Um, 
I just think it's because uh, at this point, why even why practice and why waste money trying to catch a Falcon Nine when when they just don't want to invest another dollar into that program? You like at this point, it wouldn't directly correlate. You know, um, you it's not like you build a tower for Falcon Nine and now hey, we know how to do it. It's it's going to be totally different for for the super heavy booster. Super heavy is going to be a lot bigger. It actually should have more control because it has the ability to hover. Um, will likely have hot gas thrusters to help maneuver. Uh, it's it's just a completely different system. So why you know the in theory if they if they if they think they can do it, you you actually would be doubling your cost of doing it by trying to do it first on the Falcon Nine um, arbitrarily when it really isn't necessary uh, for the Falcon Nine. For the Super Heavy, they're just trying to remove as much parts and increase performance as, as much as possible. So, um, Falcon Nine, if if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Super Heavy, let's let's go all in. I think that kind of is the best I can say on that. Starship Three D, thank you so much for your membership. Good to hear from you. Uh, Lucas says, uh, "Hey Tim, uh, when launching life leading booster on um, or other in uh, internal testish missions." Is there some arrangement to lower their liability in case it booms so they don't get hung up by investigations? You know, that I honestly have no idea about. I I have no idea. Um, that would definitely be kind of internal and in, in between them and, and the people that would be, inve- you know, the FAA investigating and things like that, too. So I, I unfortunately have no idea. But um, thank you for the good question, Lucas. Um, Casper, thanks for the membership. Uh, Kaizen, uh, why can't they land super heavy like they do Falcon 9? They absolutely can, and the first ones will. The first ones will land with a more traditional landing leg, but they want to remove the landing legs for simplicity, for quick turnarounds, for uh, mat, for for performance, because if you're not carrying those legs, uh, you, you rece- receive about a, um, for every, uh, say, a, a four kilograms of legs, you, you would reduce the payload capability by about a full kilogram so there's around a 25 percent uh payload penalty for every uh for every bit of mass that you put on the first stage so obviously you can increase performance quite a bit by not having say uh let's say say, you know let's say 40 tons uh, to be able to have actual landing legs and the structure to support it all um i have no idea i'm totally making up numbers um yeah that would be a 10 kilogram increase in your payload uh, capability so um i think that, that that's it's an eventuality thing just like they wanted to first land the Falcon 9. I think they're just trying to take everything up a, uh, up a notch. Absolutely. All right. This is from Rob. Thank you so much for becoming a member. I appreciate that. Um, Inder uh, Midley says, when Starship development is finished, how long will it be op- uh, How long will it be operational? Could it be something like Soyuz? Uh, greetings from Switzerland. Um, when st- I mean, I, I think the, the difference between Soyuz and Starship is SpaceX and especially Elon Musk is obsessed with continually refining and upgrading. We saw that with the Falcon 9. I'm shocked that they've actually that they did manage to basically stop touching the Falcon 9 finally and just let it fly and do its thing. Um, Starship will keep evolving. Starship will evolve for a very long time, and it'll be kind of a whole system. It'll almost be like a new type of vehicle altogether. Like Starships will be, uh, you know. It, with uh, kind of like we mentioned in the article that that we wrote in the video about Starship versus Falcon 9 um you know i, I think that uh yeah i i think we'll continually see them evolve basically so uh good question Marcel B uh and and not, that's not to say that Soyuz doesn't evolve but it it evolves very very little and very minimally uh, Marcel B, uh, regarding bloopers, I remember when you missed the Parker Solar Probe launch because you had your eyes on the video stream that was delayed by 30 seconds. That was a good one. That was a, a good one. Yep. <laughs> I looked up and I was like, oh, it's already launching. Whoops. Uh, Learn that lesson. <laughs> I, there's a lot. Uh, Bill Sugden says, a contribution for your future multiple robot arms for broadcast assistance. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, I do appreciate that. Uh, Jim Reed, um, hang in there, Tim. Your test will be back soon. I really hope so. I uh, actually j- just a second ago got a, a call from insurance. So uh, as soon as I get off of uh, off of all of these comments here, uh, I will probably go take care of that. Uh, Jack says, hi, Tim. Uh, the work you're doing is incredible. Do you think Starships will have uh, a different personality to them when with the exposed steel on reentry? Oh, definitely. Uh, you know, we're going to see the steel like that oftentimes, stainless steel, when it gets uh, under high temperatures, you'll start to see it uh, sometimes color, like it has this rainbow color to it. Um, I really hope that we see different starships with, you can see the burn marks where it's 
uh, the temperature has been, you know, different gradients and you actually see like purple fringing and green and stuff. I think that'll be awesome. Um, but as far as the um, exposed steel, I don't know about the personality other than hopefully the cool discoloration would be awesome. Uh, but thanks, Jack. Uh, Jameson says, much love, bro. Glad you're okay after the crash. Appreciate you and the team. Go SN9. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Jameson. I'm happy to be safe, too. Uh, the car kept me in good shape. Uh, Justin Knight, any new video deep dives or planned videos coming up? Also, are you going to upload the footage of the wreck? Uh, the footage of the wreck, so I don't actually have the, the dash cam footage. They, that dumps internally. I will be getting that from Tesla. I would maybe share that. I did have a camera that was on my face because we were just finishing up a tour of Boca Chica. Um, it's honestly kind of graphic. I shared it uh, in Discord, but it, it's it's honestly kind of graphic, and uh, I don't want I, – I just don't really want that out there um, publicly. Uh, yeah, it's – it's just kind of spooky. Like I shared it, you know, with my mom and she was like, I had to warn her, like, be careful. This is, it's actually really scary to see. Cause it's, it's violent. And, and when you get hit by a car, uh, especially a big SUV going 40 mile an hour, it's violent. So, um, if, if the dash cam, if I, if I am able to get the dash cam back, cause they, it does not save on the normal, the normal, uh, little USB card. It dumps on internal non-volatile memory. So, um, yeah. Um, bluing Corona key. Uh, that's cool. So stainless steel, when it, when it changes colors, it's called bluing. I didn't realize there's an actual name for it. Um, and as far as video deep dives, yes, there's literally two long videos in, or deep dives in the works. Uh, there's of course the Soviet rocket engine video, which is pretty much done. Um, and, uh, yeah, that one's pretty much done, but I'll, I'll probably wait to shoot that one until I get back home. Or if, uh, heaven forbid, if, if studio B's done by that time, I'll shoot it down here. Um, but, you know, every day, unfortunately, this type of stuff every day around here is something that is unrelated to shooting videos. So uh, it's kind of a this or that. I can't really do all these live streams, uh, get everything ready for Starship stuff and, and all the other planning around all of that and and be able to do scripting and research. So um, so the, the Soviet video is either going to be next or second to next. Uh, there's literally like three other videos that I have in the works. Uh, one of them I'm really excited for. We've already shot the intro to it in front of starship so um yeah you'll have to wait and see chris beginner question to spacex uh to spacex color their locks and propellants if so what are the colors um i i don't know they definitely don't add color i think i, I think locks might have a slight blue hint you know uh blue little hint to it there or that could just be the lighting but um yeah and and other than that no they, i don't think they would intentionally color them but uh, yeah, hopefully that answers those questions. Uh, Fred, do we know if the damaged DARPA satellites are on this mission after all? Love your work. Uh, we, uh, Trevor, do you know? Let Trevor let me know. Um, Lox is blue. Okay, so that's fun to know. Uh, in Discord, they're saying Lox is blue. That's awesome. So yeah, there you go. Lox is blue. I'm guessing the RP1 is more of like a yellowish, you know, transparentish yellowish color uh, because it's basically kerosene. So I'd assume it's it's more in that color because and because of some of the carbon in it and stuff, but as far as um, let's see, uh, as far as the DARPA satellites, I don't know if they actually did make it onto this mission. I don't think they did. Uh, Richard Palmer, thanks for the membership. Same with Kirian uh, and Pascal. Do you think uh, the SN9 flight will be successful? Um, I do think. S9. I actually I feel quite confident that they're actually going to stick the landing, which would just be insane. <sighs> Hopefully tomorrow or Tuesday we find out. Honestly, for me, I'm hoping it's Tuesday. Uh, new membership. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. Joel R. No Starlink on the East Coast U.S. yet. It's not about uh, East Coast. It's about your latitude. Um, so the further north you are, uh, it's it's just literally as they fill it in, the the lower and lower latitudes uh, have enough uh, enough fill in and, and no gaps to actually have reliable service right now anything below about 45 degrees north just isn't really considered even close to reliable yet but it, as they launch more satellites that stuff will fill in uh thank you very much alas i appreciate that connor um hi tim do you know if spacex plans on reusing raptors that survive test flights for future test flights such as sn9 yeah i, I do think we'll see if if they start landing boosters they'll absolutely keep the raptors around i'm sure and start flying them more and more so um, hopefully that'll help with their stockpile issue. Definitely. Um, FAA, uh, FFA09, thank you for the membership. Um, could a bird strike uh, damage, dra harm dragon if it hit badly? 
maybe um it's definitely accounted for and i think it's it's tough enough to be able to handle most bird strikes um luckily you know birds don't fly above a certain altitude so you think about how fast the falcon nine's going um, i'm pretty sure it would just make mincemeat out of a <laughs> no offense or no not to be too graphic but it would definitely just you know it could it could hit a bird and the bird would just be gone um i'm, I'm pretty sure but I, yeah Thomas says, uh, what, in your opinion, will be required to get spaceflight back into the public eye as it was in the Apollo era? How long until then? I think we're getting really close already. I think it's accelerating. We're seeing more and more people engaged in spaceflight. I think definitely by the time humans land on the moon again, it'll be, it'll be as, as much attention uh, and as popular as it was during the Apollo era. Definitely. Corey E. Um, Tim, where you live in Iowa, do they grow uh, more sweet corn or field corn? A ton of field corn. A lot of hybrid uh, I grew up doing detasseling, which is where you go through and you pick like every four out of five rows, the top of the tassels off so that you can make hybrid corn. Uh, there's a ton of, of field corn. There's also a decent amount of sweet corn, but it's, it's a lot of feed corn like that um, and hybrid corn. So yeah, Iowa stuff. Graham B, thank you so much. And uh, hang on, this is from uh, Galley, uh, wants to interview on Hyperchange. Please send him a DM. Oh, he's... He's got my info. Um, I'm, I'm friends with with Galley. I'll definitely do an interview with Galley for sure. I love Galley. Uh, Pete's host. Wouldn't it be cool if SpaceX could recover and reuse Stage Two as well? Why is it so difficult or maybe impossible? I have got a video for you. Why SpaceX will never recover and reuse a second stage for Falcon Nine? Um, the answer is Starship. Starship is how you do that, and they're not going to invest another penny in Falcon Nine. It's an outdated, antiquated system compared to when Starship gets launched. The second you fly Starship. Anything and any upgrade you do to Falcon 9 is a sunk cost. It, it did, unless you paid back all of the cost on it, I just don't see that coming. So um, it's there's it's a lot harder, too. It's, it, we'd have the aluminum has a lot lower melting point. It, it's just a totally different system. Uh, it would be cool. They talked about it for a little bit, but definitely watch my video on that. The other thing to remember is they couldn't just use the vacuum Merlin engine for landing. Its thrust to weight ratio would be stupid high. And that massive expansion nozzle would not work well for landing engine. It would likely blow up. So there's a, there's a lot of reasons, but I did make a video on that already. John Noble, hey, Tim, thanks so much for everything you uh, you do. And you have really sparked my interest in everything space and rockets. Big shout out from the UK. Well, thank you very much, John. I can't wait to travel. I definitely want to go to the UK uh, and have a big meetup once it's safe to do so. UK is one of those places I've never really spent time in England uh, other than the airport. And, and that's like top that's like top three places I want to see now. Um, definitely. Uh, David, uh, playing Kerbal while watching your stream, what are the next steps in Starship test campaign af after SN9? Which SN will have full TPS tiles, so thermal protection system tiles? I'm thinking the next step would be just higher and faster, start actually testing out the heat shield, see how it handles. Um, I think we'll see, oh, we're already seeing more on SN10 and SN11. I think SN15 might be the first time we see a full belly um, of, of tiles on Starship, but that's just a total guess. That'd be awesome. Um, Colin Maynard, so 133 non-Starlink satellites at a minimum of 2.5 is an income of 332 million good margin on that mission. Do we know, though, that is it really a minimum of 2.5 million to launch on? I don't think it would be that much for a small CubeSat or something. Um, I, I don't think it'd be quite that high, but if it is, then dang, that would be amazing. And, uh, yeah, that's that would be awesome. So we'll see. Um all right, Musical Wolves, is SpaceX now in Guinness World Records for most satellites in a launch? Also, my grandpa passed away late last night. I'm so sorry, Musical Wolves. Yeah, um, I hope that, again, I hope that you're able to be present with your family. Um, I'm really sorry to hear that. Uh, in a sense, let's, you know, we can we can absolutely celebrate this launch uh, for the life of your grandpa. I'm really, really sorry to hear that. Uh, but as far as the first bit of your question, Guinness World Records need to actually be like, you have to pay to be certified. So I don't know if SpaceX will, will do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know about a Guinness world record, but it is a world record, just factually speaking. But again, so sorry to hear about your grandpa. Uh, we're thinking about you, Musical Wolves. Um, let's see here. This is Benjamin Hearn. Doesn't stage separation change the trajectory of the second stage, e even if only slightly? Of course it does. Yep. Stage separation. It gets a little push. Uh, physical separation that increases the velocity. Uh, and slightly changes its current trajectory. But of course, that's accounted for and it's built into the flight profile. So um, it's not like they're like, oh no, it got pushed. What do we do now? You know, they, it's part of the flight plan. You know, they, they literally, mission planners see that little minor boost of, of, uh, of oomph 
and and plan that into the trajectory and then make up for it or, or you know, account for it and it's it's no big deal but yes it absolutely does riley uh, how's it going riley um ea vab everyday astronaut viewing and uh astronomy building oh that would be awesome that would be very very cool um i'll have to maybe keep that in mind there my friend uh mr animal 2000 thank you so much for your tip major tom as starlink normally goes to 350 by 200 ish kilometer orbit and over time it spreads out and circulates to a 550 kilometer are these starlink sats different as different as spacing will be now the altitude is ready i i think i think they will be different i don't even know they might even fly higher than 550 kilometers uh, because if you only have 10 of them and you want to service uh, the poles, you have to spread out so that no matter where you're at, they would basically have to be every 36 degrees at least, um, you know, in the sky. And you have to be, be a high enough altitude that that 36 degrees uh, that you can see multiple satellites in a pass. I don't know if that makes any sense, um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if they do fly them a little bit higher yet, um, just so that they have more ground coverage. A little higher latency, but I think people would gladly trade off a little bit of latency for some high-speed internet for sure. So. Um, all right. New member. Thank you so much for the membership. Uh, Matt Schroeder, these Starlink, these Starlinks just deployed where I live, Thompson, Manitoba, lots of remote indigenous communities need this in the area. Go SpaceX. That is so cool. I love hearing that. Yes, it really, I know that people don't, when we're sitting here, if you're watching me, you're fortunate. Uh, sorry to break the news to you. I don't care what your, your, you know, position is on that, but, um, if you're able to have high speed internet and able to watch a YouTube video stream, you are fortunate. There are communities around the world, even in the United States and Canada and, and developed nations that it does not make financial sense for anyone to run them a high speed internet line. Uh, you can do satellite internet, but that's terribly low latency. So you can't do uh, any kind of gaming like that. Not that that's vital to life, but it's still a nice thing that all of us enjoy probably. Um, and you definitely are, are very limited on, on bandwidth. There's very little bandwidth. And um, this will be game changing for them. This already is game changing for many, many communities. So, yeah. Um, all right. Ian Walker, thank you so much. Um, Hanalock says the super chats have been uh, a big delay if you're confused. Yes. Sorry. I'm just trying to get caught up, especially when I'm sitting there listening. Sometimes we get a backlog. I'm just trying to get through them all. So, thank you very much, um, Hanalock. Uh, Timo, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, Rich Borek says, what about a space launch slash assembly facility in space as an orbital facility? So we need to not perform all launches from earth. Well, you still, until you have a place to get resources from in space, such as the moon or an asteroid, um, you still have to get those, the propellant and, and the, the resources up into space in the first place. People ask all the time about a fuel depot in low earth orbit. Why don't they put a fuel depot up there for so starship instead of having starship come and refuel it? Well, how do you refuel the fuel depot? You could send up a bunch of tanks, but you still have to have Starship go up and fill up the tanks. And then you could sit there and waste fuel because it could be boiling off and, and heating up. So you're actually better off to not have to send up that mass in the first place of those extra tanks and literally just transfer fuel from one Starship to another directly. Because otherwise you're transferring it from a Starship into a tank arbitrarily and then loading it later. Um, it actually makes more sense to skip that. But as far as facilities in space until we actually have... Uh, other resources to be able to bring down it doesn't until you're utilizing resources in space it is it, it doesn't really give you too much other than of course like um, habitats and stuff like that would be nice but um, you're not going to be saving the launch of like launching from space unless you are making your fuel in space it's not really helping um, I am understeer thank you again for your your chat or your super chat I really appreciate that and Michael Hagland got my rocket orientation specialist shirt yesterday love it will there be any more full flow hoodies in stock I think they're supposed to be in stock now I was told last week um, I was told last week that those things were back in stock um, if so if not I'm gonna have a little talk um, let me see here I feel like hang on I'm gonna double check they're definitely, definitely, definitely supposed to be in stock. Um, yes, the full flow hoodies are back in stock. So if you've been waiting on those, um, we do have we do have them available now. Lots of larges, a lot of larges. <laughs> so if you are if you're waiting on a large, hop in there now. Um, let's see. Uh, this is from Bram. 
Uh, Starship landings look rough for people. Thoughts? No, I don't think so at all. It's a lot less G-forces uh, than a Falcon 9 landing. A Falcon 9 landing pulls three or four Gs during that dis- deceleration. It's actually, you know, if you're in the nose of that thing, the nose remains relatively still, right, in, in the flip maneuver. First off, it's going down super slow. Like, it's hard to tell how slow that is, but it is just falling so gracefully. You would you would not be panicking uh, during the belly flop maneuver. But during the belly flop to tail down, yes, it would swivel, but the G-forces are pretty low. I don't think it ever even goes above 3G during that whole landing sequence. Yes, it does a swivel, so you might want to have a chair that swivels with you or something, but um, it obviously SN8's landing was very rough and would not be recommended for people. But once they start sticking them, uh, I think it'd be no problem um, as far as the G-forces go. Now, as far as backups and, and safety, that's a different thing. But G-forces, no big deal. Uh, Lee Stamp. Hey, dude, I've I finally become a Patreon. It's only fair that uh, you get weighed in for the work you do. Let's let's get you to space. Much love from the UK. Well, thank you so much, Lee Stamp. I do appreciate that. Going to space scares the crap out of me, uh, but I did make a, pro- a promise. So... Uh, yeah, wish me luck on that. But I do really, really appreciate your support. I promise that we're working on just expanding so many things, so many avenues of Everyday Astronaut that hopefully uh, g- literally allow you guys to be able to to do some fun things um, and, and bring you access that has not been available before. So that's what we're, we're, we're working on, and I promise we're working very hard. So thank you. Uh, Data God says, SpaceX and Everyday Astronaut are a critical part of my children's homeschooling. Your enthusiasm is infectious, and we love you. That is awesome. From Canada. Well, thank you very much, Data God. I th- and again, thank you for including your family. I think that's huge. I think it's so important to have, uh, you know, parents watching with their kids, kids watching space flight. You know, it's you can think about how many people. I had so many friends that grew up with their friends watching sports. You know, and so they grew up loving sports. It's just it's part of your upbringing. You know, You're my my dad loved football. They loved the so and so, the Dallas Cowboys or whatever. So therefore, I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. Like we all know someone like that uh, in sports, and I, I definitely think. Um, that could be the, that can be the same thing for space flight, you know, oh my, my, I grew up watching rocket launches and I love rockets, you know, and just, I think that's awesome. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that with your family and for tuning in. I really appreciate that. V stray light, um, an everyday astronaut satellite could be a 3d video rig that orbits taking 3d video to be used in a VR app. So people can float in space, literally bringing space down to earth for everyday people. Definitely. Um, definitely, definitely. There's definitely been thoughts on things like that. Um, yeah, we've we we've been thinking about some different things here and there, but um, nothing too seriously yet. That's definitely like a, a more distant future proposition. I, there's a lot of things that I want to accomplish here first. So, um, all right. So Richard Schindel says, uh, not too much, but maybe it'll help you get a cup of joe when you're on the road. Question: Which um, a- our amateur group could get someone to that Carmen line first? Um, the f- amateur group that's I think going to cross the Carmen line and, and actually is working on it very actively, of course, is Copenhagen Suborbitals out of Copenhagen, Denmark. Definitely check out their channel. Their channel is amazing, the, the work they produce, and definitely be supporting them on Patreon if you can. You're literally helping them build rockets that are that they're working on sending someone above the Kármán line. Like, amateurs doing it. It's it's absolutely incredible. So, um, yeah, very, very cool. Aaron Barnes, um, is it possible they can um, make a super heavy with Starship using three boosters? Um, So basically, yeah, super heavy, heavy, or super, super heavy. Yeah, super, it'd be super heavy, heavy, basically, or Starship heavy. Um, No, they won't ever do that. Elon has sworn off the triple core configuration as being way more complicated than it's worth. Starship can scale so easily because they're building rings. You can upgrade Starship by just increasing the diameter of Starship and and eventually increasing the height. But it can work because you have like literally Raptor engines that you can just stick more Raptor engines and make another ring of. You can go from 9 meters to 12 meters to 18 meters. You can just increase the size of Starship once they have the system figured out and drastically improve, uh, increase performance uh, immediately uh, without having to try to do a a triple core or anything like that. Um, It just do the same thing, but just bigger and increase the performance that way. It's a lot simpler in the long run for sure. Um, yeah. Um, Azrin, thank you so much. Pete UK, do you have uh, a GoFundMe for a seat on Blue Origin? I would chip in. I've always wanted to be an astronaut, but you would be better. Um, I don't have anything like that because, frankly, I, I don't want to yet. <laughs> uh, I think the timing already is going to be too fast. Uh, Patreon, we are almost halfway to the 10,000 patron mark, which is absolutely wild. 
which is what I arbitrarily set as a joke of I will go to space at 10,000. And I did not think that was ever a thing that I would ever have to consider. And now it's a thing I have to consider. Um, so I'm sorry, but please don't go fund me a seat on Blue Origin. Give me time to give me time to get ready. <laughs> it's getting coming up too close already. Uh, Paul is playing when the stars align and the blue moon rises. Um, I would like to meet you one day and buy you a beer and whiskey. Go team space. Um, I miss meetups for sure. And I think, you know, I, I definitely want to someday. It might be a 2022 thing, but I, I want to do tours. I want to do little like 10 day tours, you know, 10 cities around Europe uh, 10 cities around, you know, the U S then maybe start doing, you know, uh, like Australia and New Zealand, do a couple dates there too, just, and do like a speaking tour or something fun, something maybe interactive or something. Um, yeah. And I, I miss doing meetups for sure. So stay tuned. Maybe that will be a thing we can get back into. Hopefully we can do by the end of this year, start doing some just normal meetups, maybe not a big tour thing, but some normal meetups. Um, from Jan or Jan, sorry, uh, probably Jan, uh, thanks a, uh, a lot for your work. Why did the satellites separate in the dark side if they're going into sun synchronous orbit? Cheers from Germany. So sun synchronous orbit doesn't mean that it's always illuminated by the sun. It means that it's, um, as it's passing on the daylight side, the sun's always in the same relative position. So it's, it's like the orbit is lined up with the sun. So say you are the sun, here's the earth. The orbit is just like this it's on this plane going this way so that, as the earth spins around it, as the satellites go over, uh, you know, on the daylight side, they can image directly on from the sun to get the same, same light every single pass. Um, so they still do go into the dark side. Yeah. Good question though. Um, this is from Ian Levy. Um, I have VS, uh, I have VSAT. It's incredibly unreliable and has 600 plus m uh, millisecond ping. Uh, Starlink will be cheaper and astronomically better than my current service. Exactly. Um, I'm surprised that you're actually able to even live, you know, watch a stream, honestly, Ian. But I think it'll be game changing for a lot of people. Quantum Fire, uh, Tim, when will you perform your music live at Boca? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I definitely want to be able to perform music live someday again. That seems like a, a long way away, but I, that is something I would actually like to do. If there's a speaking tour, I think it'd be really fun to have like an after party. Uh, you know, do like a more formal family setting speaking tour, and then in the same town or same city book book a bar that night and actually do uh just play music and and have like a a party i think that'd be really fun um so i don't maybe that we do that down here in in boca too someday tom murphy how's it going uh hey tim if youtube goes belly up do you have an alternate plans to continue your broadcasting not yet i have a little bit too many too much eggs in one basket at this point i definitely want to diversify a little bit um, I guess, you know, Facebook right now, there's a handful of followers there. I could probably grow that if I needed to. Um, but hopefully, I don't know. I, I've i done Twitch before in the past. You know, there's always other services, but getting your audience to follow you on those other services. The thing is, if all of YouTube totally were just to go belly up, hopefully it'd be really obvious the path of what's next and where the audiences are going. So say you YouTube's dying, blah, blah, blah. It's because audiences are going somewhere else. So it'd be an obvious transition that like, okay, clearly everyone's, you know, ditching YouTube and going to X, you know, and uh, it'd be easy to be able to make that transition hopefully with it. So I, I don't really have too much of a backup plan. I could always uh, stream on Twitter, uh, Twitch and Facebook if I need to as well. Um, Cause I do have a, a decent following on there as well, but I don't really, uh, I'm not planning on that yet because I don't really see one of the world's largest websites going down anytime too soon, but you do have to be, you got to be agile though, if necessary. Uh, Bram G, thoughts on refueling, risk reduction, and approval. I, that's definitely, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how they're going to not have a starship blow up on orbit, working on, uh, on orbit refueling at some point, which would be catastrophic amount of space debris. That's something I definitely want to ask Elon about for sure. For sure. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't I don't know the answer to that though, but it is definitely a concern of mine. Uh, Moniel says, "Greetings from Poland. Thanks for your broadcast. What is by you the biggest jump in rocket launch technology since shuttle missions? It's definitely been reusable boosters. Um, SpaceX's Falcon 9 landing like we just saw today and flying uh, coming. They've flown eight times the same booster eight times now. That's game changing. Uh, just just working on a commercial version of something that can that can bring the cost of spaceflight way down." is uh is absolutely the biggest jump in rocket launch technology and i think starship will take that up another notch by a lot because you obviously have the full entire vehicle fully and rapidly reusable using a cheaper fuel 
Uh, even if the cost, even if the cost gets cut in half per kilogram, which there's almost no way it should be at least ten times cheaper, at least um, that would be beyond game changing. That will that will totally change the economics of spaceflight. So, uh, yeah, reusability, truly reusability, is definitely um, definitely the game changing thing. Um, from Peter, uh, Earth, uh, Equus Astra, re, re, something a uh, Terra human. In. I can't even read that. I'm sorry, but I don't think that's <laughs> going to be my thing. Uh, I would never remember it, and I would miss say it and mispronounce it every single time. Uh, I'm a terrible pronouncinator, as you guys know. Uh, from toy toys are for boys. Uh, funeral home near me needs Starlink. They have ex uh, exploring it. Horrible Satnet in Canada. They have a live stream for their services. Oops, uh, because of COVID. Yes. Um, yeah. That's that's a, a shame. Oh, are the things not popping up now? I'm sorry. I realize that you guys have not been seeing. You might not have been seeing the things lately. Hang on. Let me see. Crap. I lost the. Uh, sorry, guys. I realize you haven't been able to see the comments. Uh, but toys are for boys. Uh, yes. Every a lot of people are going to benefit from from that absolutely um thank you for saying hi sorry that i realized comments aren't going up on stream I, I would normally uh i would definitely normally have someone fixing that but uh today it's just me but thank you and hopefully it can service people like that very soon uh oh and the clock stopped it looks like maybe that program crashed or something interesting okay oh well we're almost done here tim anderson uh being of a certain vintage i i uh I never missed a, a Mercury, Gemini, or Apollo launch as a kid. Awesome to see the journey back on track, and thank you for being um, our eyes and ears. Well, thank you very much, Tim. Yes, I really do hope that we're on a cusp of a new spaceflight era. Um, I really do believe it. I really, really do believe it. So um, I can feel it, and, and it's coming, and, it, and it's quite obvious. And the attention is is growing. The excitement is growing. There's more and more things happening, so it's snowballing, you know, so... It's a new. It's definitely going to be a new Apollo era, and I, I'm so excited that we're all able to witness it this time with even better coverage than we had in the '60s. You know, and more stuff is, um, yeah, more stuff is publicly available for sure. So, thank you, Tim, and thank you to everybody for tuning in, for hanging out with me this much longer. I mean, holy crap! I need to go get lunch already. I did not think that was going to happen. Uh, I appreciate all of you for hanging out, saying hi. Uh, and for all the super chats and all the, the donations, you guys mean a lot. And if you want to help me continue to do what I do, uh, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter by going to patreon.com slash everyday astronaut. You can gain access to our li our exclusive live streams, uh, some of the scripts and research, um, just kind of the, the awesome community that is uh, that is our Discord channel too. Our, hi, Discord. I love you guys. And uh, yeah, so if you want to help me do what I do and, and make it even bigger and better and just more awesome uh consider becoming a patreon supporter yeah patreon.com slash everyday astronaut um so thank you guys thank you everyone for tuning in sorry for the the issues that i had um i will be uh hopefully much more oiled and we'll have a helper for sn9 so uh so hopefully hopefully sn9 launches on tuesday i don't think i'm quite ready for it tomorrow but we'll see you then guys i will provide as much coverage as humanly possible and uh, that's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. And now I have to walk over, hit a bunch of buttons, and try to transition out of this thing without messing it up. Spoiler, I'm going to probably mess it up. But meanwhile, wish me luck. All right. We'll see you guys.